Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. And uh, man, we got a, I'm really excited about my guest today with Mike Munford. This is our first banjo player and what a hell of a banjo player he is. Uh, let me give you a quick introduction. First, I just want to thank our mutual friend, Chris Lucat for hooking us up. Chris, thank you very much. Chris and Mike, along with uh, Frank Sullivan, and I, sorry, I don't know your bass players and they're all part of Frank. Jeremy Middleton. Jeremy Middleton. Uh, they're all part of Frank Sullivan, Dirty Kitchen. If you haven't heard those guys, you'll we'll talk a, a lot about them today. Uh, I've had Chris on, I've had Frank on, and now Mike, hell of a band. These guys are incredibly talented. They're, uh, I hate to say the word progressive bluegrass. To me, you're like a rock band with a mandolin and a band. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's, anyway, uh, also make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to the show. If you're watching us on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button and the little emoji icon that looks like a bell that helps us get recommended by YouTube. And I certainly help uh, appreciate your support on that. All right. Mike Munford, born in St. Louis, raised in Baltimore. Mike started playing banjo at age 15. He's been a professional bluegrass musician since 1976. And he spent ton of time developing his craft. He's also a, uh, a well-known sharpshooter with respect to uh, helping people with setups and things like that with uh, specifically banjo, mandolin, and to a lesser extent, guitar. Uh, his fluid style, tasteful and driving, allows him to easily blend traditional and contemporary bluegrass influences into his music. As I said, he's currently touring with Frank Sullivan, S-O-L-I-V-A-N, and Dirty Kitchen. They are a highly acclaimed contemporary blue bluegrass band. They've got multiple Grammy nominations. And in fact, Mike received Banjo Player of the Year from the IBMA, which is International Bluegrass Music Association. He's well known throughout the mid Atlantic region for his uh, melodic and fiery playing. And uh, if, if you've been around Baltimore, DC, Pennsylvania, even up and down a little bit of uh, Virginia and up and down the East coast, Mike has a pretty good reputation there. He's been in that area a long time. Mike, thank you so much for your time. Thank post you post for snowstorm. Oh man. It's my pleasure. Just one cor correction on the, yeah, the please. Setup. Yeah. More guitar, not as much mandolin, <laughs> not as much mandolin. There you go. Thank you. And I'll tell you how to get a hold of Mike after sure. this. <laughs> uh, did you grow up in a musical family? Because I noticed that's a very common bluegrass thread. It really is, and I really didn't. Uh, <laughs> my folks love music. Uh, my parents love classical music, maybe a little bit of Dixieland, that kind of thing. You know, they, they had a, a good, really good record collection, mostly classical. My older brother loved rock, and so I would hear that. Uh, nobody would played but there was a healthy appreciation of music. So I was exposed to good music. Um, but you know, when I got into the bluegrass world, I realized, good Lord, so many of these people like Frank, mm. for ex example, really raised from, you know, from day one around it, you know, a lot of, uh, and he has a very large extended family. So there's just a lot of musicians played and just having that kind of thing around the house. And then finding out that uh, most of the, the bluegrass uh, pioneers, you, you could say, were really raised in that environment of music was around the house. And it was guitars, mandolins, banjos, fiddles, and singing and the whole thing. So I felt, you know, like really coming in from a completely different angle. Once I sort of discovered this music for myself at 15, I really was not aware of it. And even though I had heard uh, you know other forms of music and nothing really intrigued me quite like the banjo mm -hmm. um yeah i heard guitar playing and i heard you know great classical and i would hear snippets of things and go well, well that's really pretty or well that's a that's a nice sound right there and of course i heard the beatles growing up um i wasn't a beatles fan i wasn't really into the yeah 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 type beatles but when i heard yesterday i remember thinking that's that's really nice and other tunes that were catchy but again, not enough to really like go after the guitar or, yeah, I want to be a classical violinist or piano. But I had heard the banjo, uh, well, through Earl Scruggs, who had played the theme to Beverly Hillbillies. And I liked it. I can't say I went completely nuts for it, but I remember being intrigued by that, especially the, the sound of the instrument. And I knew it was a banjo, but I didn't know what kind of banjo. It wasn't until later I, I understood that there are tenor banjos played in Dixieland, four-string tenor banjos that are strummed, and then the five-string bluegrass banjo, which is finger-picked. Um, 
so I didn't understand the difference of banjos, but I knew that the twangy sound was a banjo. I thought, well, that's really neat. And what intrigued me was hearing it being played initially slowly, just like just slow little thing. And then it speeds up right at the yeah. beginning of that of that theme. You know, when when the announcer goes the Beverly Hillbillies and is it don't, 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 you know, it, when it starts up, that just that killed me. Not just me, but I think thousands of people who weren't exposed to this music as a household thing, but heard things like that. It made a huge impact. Um, dueling banjos had, had come out around the time I started playing. In fact, that was about a year before, and I was hearing that on the radio, and I had no music lessons. I, you know, I hadn't had any music lessons as a kid. And when I first heard dueling banjos on pop radio, I thought it was a lesson going on. I really did. I mean, here I'm listening <laughs> to whatever is on pop radio at the time, you know, in, in 72, 73. And then I hear this kind of ragged, you know, very slow guitar and a banjo kind of back and forth. And this is weird. It sounds to me like a music lesson that's going. I hadn't seen the movie yet. So I didn't know what this music was. I hadn't seen Deliverance. So I hear it. And then when it speeds up and goes into the fast part, of dueling banjos i was like whoa what is this it suddenly went from a music lesson to you know all this really you know fast banjo playing and i thought that really intrigued me i mean just the the, the power of that and the and it, it didn't sound like anything that i was familiar with at all so that just um that made a huge impression on me that that, that really stood out who, who was who who played who was playing banjo and acoustic guitar on doodling banjos do you know yeah eric weisberg who was a session musician up in new york city a uh, well-known player and session player and very well um uh, academically um educated musician he played a, a, a lot of different instruments and he did that happened to do that session and I was a guy who, uh, I guess a buddy of his, he knew up in New York, Steve Mandel, who eventually moved to Baltimore, um, was the guitar player on that cut. So Eric Weisberg, Steve Mandel. That's pretty, are those guys still around? I have to see. Well, if I... Sadly, they've passed passed away. Both uh, of them. Eric, yeah. I think just in the last year, I want to say, and, uh, Steve three years ago, I think. I don't uh, have the exact date, but I got to meet Steve a, a, a several years ago. Great guy, very just easygoing guy. And he still loved to play and jam and all that kind of thing. And Eric, as far as I knew, still lived up in the, I think up in the Woodstock, New York area. There's That's quite a, a real a yeah. community of musicians that live in that zone. Huge. Yeah. And uh, I think he was still up there, but maybe not as active in, in recent years. Very they, cool. They had both passed away. Yeah. So you, you get hip to this music and you're like I'm clearly enthusiastic and taken over by it. You just ask your folks, hey, can you buy me a banjo? How did that go? Well, not, not really. It, it was a complete backdoor happenstance. Uh, I remember I was out, you know, just hanging with a friend of mine on a Sunday afternoon somewhere. And he, and he says, hey, man, you got to come over and check out this banjo I got. Oh my God. And, and I was like, and we were good friends since, you know, childhood and all that. And we were always doing a lot of different things. And, and I, my first thing was like, well, why, you know, what, you know, why, why'd you get a banjo? So we go down this basement and he starts playing a little bit. He could play, you know, not, not a lot. He'd only been doing this for maybe a few months, less than a year. And I thought, wow, that sounds familiar. So what, what is that? He said, it's bluegrass bluegrass music and i'm like what's that i hadn't even heard that term i didn't know anything about kentucky being the bluegrass state or bill monroe and the bluegrass boys I, this is completely new information pouring into me on september 9th 1973 i mean it's just like oh that God, was the date that's so that's crazy you know, there was everything before and everything since and um and he says you know you've heard uh you've heard dilling banjo I said yeah i have i really like that he says and you know this guy Earl Scruggs uh, on Beverly Hillbillies. You've heard that, right? Said, yeah, I have heard that. And then he started playing a tune, Foggy Mountain Breakdown, which is a real anthem, bluegrass mm -hmm. banjo anthem that Earl Scruggs wrote back in the late 40s, 48. And he started playing, he could play a little bit of it, but then he put on an Earl Scruggs record. 
And it wasn't a classic bluegrass album. It was called Earl Scruggs Review Live at Kansas State. It was sort of a country rock band that Earl had with his sons then. Anyway, he put on this cut of Foggy Mountain, and it was like, that's it. I've heard that. And I had heard that on the radio, but didn't know what it was. Foggy Mountain Breakdown, I didn't know what the, the, the title meant. I had no idea what was going on. But I said, man, I've heard this Foggy Mountain Breakdown. They would play that sometimes at Memorial Stadium at Orioles games, maybe between innings <laughs> or something. I, mean, I would just hear it once in a while with no idea what it was. But when he started playing it and, and then my buddy could play it a little bit and just the, I was absolutely stunned. Uh, just the, even, not only the sound of it, but even the visual of it. I hadn't seen anybody play an instrument five feet away from me before. When I saw his right hand and the, the finger motion and the picks and then the way his left hand was moving on the neck. And again, he'd only been playing about a year, but he could play this tune. I was like, man, sign me up right now. Wow. This is it. This thing just nailed me right between the ears and the eyes. I just, I, I was jaw hanging down. I said, I don't care what it takes. I just want to be able to do that. What you're doing right there, sitting in that chair, I want to be able to do that. And, and nothing more. You know, it wasn't like, okay, I'm going to be a bluegrass musician and go on the opera. I mean, nothing at all like that. It was like, I just want to be able to play that song. I want to get one of this instrument and you got to show me how to do that. So how, what, how do, what is your viewpoint on stuff like that? Because I hear hundreds and hundreds of stories. Here you are, you're a kid, you're totally fascinated. Yeah. No parents, as far as parents are not musically inclined. Uh, you, you're in love with this banjo music and your friend randomly says to you, hey, come to my house and check out my banjo. And then that changes your life. As you said, it was life before. Life. That day, right. I know the time, date, and temperature of that that moment. So how do you view stuff like that? Do you look at it like uh, there's a higher power moving things around or serendipity or like how do you – what's yeah. the – you know, is it random? What's the chance? It is random. I like to think about the higher power. I'm all open to possibly it's a, a grand plan. Yeah. Uh, serendipity could be – but random – you know, there's a lot of random. I mean, when you think about the billions of people on the planet, there are bound to be similar things that happen that just happen at the right time, at the right place and all that kind of thing. I mean, just all the events that are going on in any one second. Right. The planet, there are bound right. to be a few things that line up. And that just happened to be one that lined up that day. Uh, so, yeah, that's how I feel about it. It's a combination of all yeah. of that. That always freaks me out when I, cause I've heard yeah. hundreds of stories. I mean, like, you know, if you were 10 minutes late, the conversation probably wouldn't have had, you know, you might've been talking right. about the Orioles versus the Yankees or exactly. something. You know? could, uh, he could have, or he could have not mentioned it at all. He could have right. just gone on home. Right. And Joe and I would have gone home and done what I was doing as a 15 year old kid, which was just riding bikes and throwing a ball around and right. farthest thing from my mind. It, and it always, <laughs> uh, I, I, because I hear so many stories, it, it's, it's a, it allows me to be like really optimistic, to be honest with you, yeah. because I, you know, I'm hearing this all day long of, wow, there's so many, the possibility is always there. You just got to be doing something to get in traction in, in traffic, you know, like you're not going to, it's not going to happen if you're sitting in your house. Well, that's true. And sometimes there is luck. Now, you know, you hear a lot of these expressions. I love these expressions. Yeah, the luckier it seems like the luckier I am or the harder I the work. Harder the harder I work. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. There, there's some truth to that. Yeah. And I've heard other things that something about success or something is the combination of preparation, meeting oppor opportunity. Right. You know, these are all viable expressions, but sometimes it is absolute flat out dumb luck. Yeah. <laughs> it really is. Yes. It just, is, it just falls. You're walking down the street and it just falls right on top of you yeah. for no reason. Well, I'm glad it fell on top of you, man. And it seems like so are you. So. Oh, I am too. And that, actually, Bela Fleck, you're probably familiar with. Oh, Bela yeah, Fleck. of course. Anybody in music would be familiar with him, certainly. Uh, had a, uh, an opening, or he wrote an introduction to a book about Earl Scruggs a few years ago. And he wrote the introduction. And it was really well put. He talked about it. That, that something about this music activates something that might be deep inside you. And this, this probably applies to a lot of different musicians, actors, whatever, but, but that, that it's almost like 
you know, you were predisposed to maybe going for this sound and then somebody comes along who exposes you to it and plays it and you're like, everything goes just nuts in your mind. Like, that's it. That has activated some kind of thing deep down right. in my bones that really speaks to me. Yeah. So, you know, he just, he put it in so many words relating it to him hearing the banjo, you know, for the first time. Also, he was exposed to the same thing, Earl Scruggs playing ballad of Jed Clampett, you know, as a, hearing that as a kid, but thousands of people got in through that door too. But I, I imagine that's true for anybody who seeks any particular craft. I th yeah, I think or, it's any or, creative or, pursuit. Yeah any creative pursuit yeah that something a, a light goes off because man that's for me whether yeah. it's investment banking or acting or you know science whatever yeah but it's it, and you it, can it, tell it, when it's not too i mean just by as easily you can certainly tell when it's like man that ain't for me yeah totally yeah, man. that looks pretty good that's sort of fun but no not really yeah totally i get that I mean, what so, I like to say, yeah, I mean, go ahead. Fine. No, 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 you guys, go ahead. What were you going to say? I was just going to say, because some people say, you know, like, you know, like the, this is like a big thing that came along. And I and I remember having that idea. I remember as a kid, I was into different things. In fact, this guy who uh, who got me exposed to the banjo, we used to make films, we used to make movies and get kids in the neighborhood to write the story. He was more into that. He would make up the story. We were really into filmmaking special effects and you know fight scenes and you know all this kind of stuff and uh, you know we were like really uh, that's what I wanted to do before I got into music was like go to Hollywood and be a special effects guy I was like fascinated by behind the scenes not acting but special effects and how do they do this and all movie magic and you know all this kind of stuff so anyway I was like deep into that and then when this music thing came along man I just dropped that like every you know film gone you know just sort of like eh. and that's the way you are at that age where you're hot on something for a year or two maybe and then yeah. it's like the next big thing comes along right yeah 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 and so when this music thing came along that was the next big thing and then i wondered well i'll probably do that for a year i'll probably, i figured well I'll, I'll take lessons i'll learn how to play this song and then i'll wait for the next big thing but the next big thing never came this was your big thing the next big thing never came to this day I haven't come yeah. across something where I go, man, I've, that's what I really wish I had done. I really wow. wish I had, you know, gotten into nuclear physics or something. You, you never, you never <laughs> sat down in bed at night thinking, man, I, I could have been a cost accountant. <laughs> no, that's, not, that's, not, that's not putting that down. Cause that always sounds like the, the go-to line. Like I wouldn't, but you know what? There are people who love that too. Absolutely. And, and like, through music, it's Better. Totally you can be passionate about anything. Yes, you can. And I love that. I, th I think that's a wonderful thing. And there are people who are like, man, they are passionate about being cost accountants or, <laughs> or, or whatever they're doing. They could be really into it. And by the same token, sadly, the other way, I've seen musicians who aren't that into it. Some yeah, I don't know. I good. don't think their careers tend to have as long. I don't, they don't. Well, I don't think you could be as successful. They may be extremely gifted and talented and be able to really play, but boy, they like lost the joy. Yeah. Like yeah. 30 years ago, I would encounter guys like that. Every once in a while, I'd come across someone who's known, you know, not, you know, a, a really good player. And then you say, man, you know, you'd be all excited, you know, puppy dog. How do you do this? Like, nah, kid, you know, I don't listen to that stuff anymore. Oh, man, do, you, do you still practice? You know, no, I haven't touched it. You know, I only play gigs on the weekends. I don't, I don't, yeah, I never touch it. You know? That's one of those, uh, what do they say? Be and careful. It's just like, I remember that being sort of shocked by that, but I thought, well, hey, the guy's 30 years older than me. He's got the experience. Maybe that could happen to me too. So I, I better not, I don't want to be judgmental about that. But I remember thinking, man, I don't want to go that way. If it starts turning that way, I better find something else. I will tell you that probably 90% of the guests I've had on this show still have the fairly high level of enthusiasm and 10% are just like you off the charts, like yeah. just as passionate today as you were on December, you know, September 9th, 1973. Well, I can, I can t honestly say it, it's even more passionate now than ever. That's cool, man. Because, because as I'm getting, I'm coming up on 63 now, uh, and not to not to get into the dark thing, but you know, <laughs> but I realize I'm well over middle age, and there's only a certain amount of time left, and 
on for two reasons i'm more passionate about it for one thing i understand it better now Mm -hmm. i can access the things that that really turn me on about music i mean i can just get them they're not elusive things that i have to like man sometimes it strikes me sometimes it doesn't i really know when it's when it it's something that's really doing something for me and i can access it either by playing it or listening to something inspiring so it's years of playing and experience of being able to sort of like dial that in and also, yeah, time's ticking. Yeah. That's a big and thing. So I'm man. like really enjoying it. I, when I pick it up, even through all this, you know, sitting around the house and pick up and play, I realize, man, it is a gift now. Yeah. Totally. I mean, every time, if I spend five minutes playing, it's like, I really cherish that. That's I great. I really, really do. Yeah, because as you get older, you're like, man, I should only focus my time on doing stuff that makes me feel good. It gets me happy. Yeah. Because, yeah, like you said, do that, but yeah. now's the time to really do that. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds selfish, but I'll tell you, it's it's almost uh, universal. I mean, when I read interviews with anybody in any field, they all say the same thing. By yeah. the time you hit this age, you start prioritizing in a different way. Totally. Well, man, you I'll know, tell you what. You go, man, I'm on the last lap. I've already rounded third and heading home. And it's got to be, you know, and, and if that means pursuing other things that you always put on the back burner or just passionately digging deeper into the thing you've always been doing, whatever it is, now's the time. <laughs> I agree with you, man. Now is the time. And it really strikes everybody pretty much at that same time. Yeah. Of the, yeah 50s, mid 50s. Yeah. Late 50s, yeah. something like that. All right. So you've. You discover banjo. Your folks are supportive, it sounds like, of, of you in general, creative pursuits. Yeah, but I did want to do it on my own terms. And when I came home and said, hey, I want to get a banjo, they're like, well, sure, we'll get you, you know, we'll get you one. You know, if you're, I said, no, I was working part time at a gas station after school and uh, had a paper route, all, that whole thing, you know. <clears throat> and uh, I said, I've got a little bit of money. I can get, I'll get a banjo there. At that time, you could get one for 75 bucks. Wow. So I really wanted to do that. I didn't want to fall into the, well, look, we got you this thing, son. And, you know, yeah, I'm not yeah. playing it. I really wanted it to be on my own terms because I know how I was then. If, you, if it didn't stick, I would have quit in two weeks. And you didn't want to be obligated to practice because of somebody else's because, contribution. Because, hey, we got you this thing. And then I would you know, end up resenting it or them and all that and all the scenes you see in all the sitcoms. <laughs> Well, let me ask you a question. That is a very, being that independent is not common at that yeah. age. How do, how do you, what, uh, figure out the right question. What do you think about you made you that independent at that age? Well, it could be nature and nurture, you know, all the, those things there in general, I was kind of a, it was an interesting neighborhood, really nice neighborhood upper really? middle class neighborhood, a lot of professionals and private school upbringing, the whole thing. Where was in, this? Where'd you grow up? Uh, in, Baltimore, in Baltimore, in a neighborhood called Roland Park. Very nice neighborhood, good folks, um, kind of a, a sheltered upbringing, I would say, because it was all pretty much prep school kids. We all went to this. We didn't all go to the same school, but we went to the same type of schools. And so but even you, more, you, know, so you sort of you, you sort of find your way, you know, in and amongst people, and you're starting to, you know, socialize even within your sheltered little zone there. And I started realizing that I wasn't always in sync with everybody else, uh, naturally. I mean, like when other kids were into sports, I was into some other thing. And by the time they lost interest, that's when I got into it. And I don't think I was doing that deliberately. Like everybody would love baseball, and I'd be like, eh, I could care less. And then they sort of grew out of it by the time they were in their mid teens. And that's when I started really liking baseball and just as an example, but I, but it wasn't a deliberate attempt to be, you know, different uh, contrary. Yeah. I just found it. I just liked, liked it that way. You know, I just sort of would find it on my own. And it's just like, when it finally hit me, then I would get into it. And if it didn't hit me, I didn't go along with it. So if everybody was into something, if I liked it, I'd go, yeah, I like that. But if they were all into a thing um, and I didn't, I, I wouldn't go along just to go along. I mean, I just didn't feel the, the, the pull to do that. I mean, I felt some of that in high school. You feel some of that peer pressure thing. And sure, you do a little bit of that. But for the most part, I realized what is, what works, what flies and what dies. 
And so that's part of it. And then the other part was, you know, advice from my dad one time, which was really, I think, really, you, I think you had a thing in there about uh, advice from mother and dad. Yeah, most important thing your dad. Yeah. Uh, from my dad, I remember this at around age 12 or so, you know, some plans fell through on the weekend with a bunch of guys or whatever, go to a movie or whatever, it all fell through. And I was all upset. It's like, ah, you know, had nothing to do. And, and he said, man, don't depend on your friends and family for entertainment. You know, he was meaning basically, you know, don't depend on other people to keep you entertained. You know, if you, if, if something falls through, find another way. He didn't really paraphrase, I'm paraphrasing to some extent sure. he didn't say it in so many words, but it's really hit me like, yeah, I can always just go out and ride a bike. I can go down to the basement and get into something. I can go do something on my own. I don't have to be like all upset because plans fell through. But that you, was a but major, you, that was major. But you do realize, and all the more so telling me that you kind of grew up in a, an upper middle class background yeah, to be that independent is even more far removed because most, really? yeah, because most people that grow up in a the look the better qual and I don't think it was as prevalent years ago as it is today. It's like grossly abusive today, uh -huh. uh, but the more affluent or professional even the the, the environment you typically get more. Just because that's you know, your parents have more money than you know when you're growing up blue collar, yeah. And so the fact that you were still that independent and you you said, "No, I want to do this on my own turn." Man, that is really there's some good shit going on there, man. Well, I think again that's a parental influence. My my folks were very level headed about that. My dad was not raised in that environment. He was raised uh, not in a professional environment and all that. Right. Kind of and no, they were not the kind to give to just give us anything we wanted. They didn't spoil us at That's all. But what they did give us was incredible anyway. Growing yeah. up in a nice neighborhood, nice environment, go, went to a good school and all that. I mean, they gave already so much. But no, it wasn't like, hey, I want a car when I'm 16. OK, you know, it was none of that. We, didn't, we, we didn't belong to the country club. My parents were not country club type people. They were not interested in any of that. So, so no, you know, they, they, they didn't, they didn't indulge that. And they really sort of set that example of, man, if you want something, you got, you have to put the time and effort in That's and great. work for it. Or if you want to get this thing, you know, you're going to have to save your allowance or go get a job or mow lawns or whatever and save yeah. up and get that. I mean, they really instilled that. That's and great. I'm yeah, so really appreciative, so appreciative of them for that, because I, I could have easily been, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, let me, let me tell I you. Want, I want it all. Give it to me. Okay. And I don't want to sound like an old curmudgeon, because I'm not, but I will tell you right now, uh, having grown up in a blue collar environment and somehow working my way up a little bit, and then seeing how other parents are, it is ridiculous. I mean- I know parents that bought their kids and, and this is almost, this is so surreal. It, it's like, I, it's, I feel it's embarrassing for them. I know this couple, they bought their kid a BMW, you know, a $40,000 BMW when he was 15, because God forbid, God forbid he had to wait even one day after he turned 16. Yeah. I mean, like when, and that's like, not, this isn't an affluent area. It's just a, a middle-class, upper middle-class that's nuts. You're killing people doing that, in well, my you opinion. Know, it stems from the, there's a, you know, the cliche kind of scenario. I want to give my kids everything I didn't have. I want, I want them to have the childhood I didn't have kind of a thing. And it all comes from, a, you know, what's seemingly, you know, a, a good place, sort of like the road to hell thing. <laughs> Pave like with good intentions. Yeah, yeah man. It's like, man, I really want to, you know, I don't want them to feel deprived of the things, you know, it's a, it's a natural tendency, but it just has sometimes gone too far the other way way i mean but like you know to me like what you had good house good parents loving yeah. you know food on the table yes. you know hobbies activities yeah. that's like what to me that's what makes your life rich anyway that no one's gonna totally. remember and i think I that kid's gonna remember. like that yeah i mean i still live my life as long as there's food on the table hobbies and you know 
just easy health. going lifestyle health, health yeah. uh, in general and and you know that's uh that's that has worked for me i agree with you man 100%. Well, the other part of advice though that you know because i really like that question yeah uh, yeah uh from my mother's side was find something you enjoy doing and go for it that's really don't, cool don't drag your don't end up dragging yourself to work to a job for the rest of your life i mean good lord <laughs> You know, it's just, I mean, you hear those things. People say that, you know, that whole thing. You find something you love to do and you never work a day in your life. I mean, those are the lines. But it's true. It's but true. It's, but there is truth. And not to say that there isn't work and there are down times and there are times where you're like, man, is this really what I signed up for? <laughs> you know, all that kind of stuff that comes along later, but you learn how to deal with it. But, but, it, but again, it's just sort of that register. It's like, you know, I don't know at what age, but probably she told me that around the age of 13, 14, 15. Very cool. Something had come up and she's, you know, had mentioned that. So yeah, number one, don't depend on others. Don't depend on your friends and family for entertainment. Yeah. Yeah. And number two, find something you really want to do and, 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 and go for that, you know, she didn't spell out well any not didn't really elaborate on it but that was that's what came through and it's like yeah man both of those are pure gold yeah man and so yeah, okay so you get your banjo yeah and did you get lessons yeah from this kid i took okay. lessons i actually paid him for you know a couple of bucks for lessons you know that's so funny and, and uh I would go over on Sunday afternoons and get like a little half hour lesson. And he started teaching me out of a Pete Seeger banjo book. And you know, again, all these, I didn't know who Pete Seeger was. He was known nationally on the folk world, but again, I didn't have any exposure to any of that, but I took lessons from him for about maybe a month or two. And then not long after that, he sort of lost interest. He was into a lot of different things, filmmaking art. He was a very talented artist yeah. and he was going to art school and, um, you know, he, he he stayed with music a little while longer, but sort of dropped it. You know, that wasn't his main focus after mm. a year or so. So I just started going my own way and, that, you know, really knowing nothing. But again, you talk about things that, that sort of fall into place. I mean, here, the, my only link to this in a human way was this kid up the street. But my brother points out a Sunday Sun article. That's the newspaper in Baltimore, the Sun Papers. It was all about bluegrass. And, uh, you know, talked about the music. I was like, well, this isn't interesting. And at the bottom of the article, the very end says, if you want to learn more about bluegrass, look up Bluegrass Unlimited Magazine, Burke, Virginia. That's all it said. So that's the old days. You get on the phone, long distance, you know. 1-800-555-1212. You know, it's coming in like that. Burke, Virginia, information. Yeah, Bluegrass Unlimited, yes. Called Bluegrass Unlimited, yes. Hello. You know, gosh, a magazine, a bluegrass magazine, sign me up for that. So I remember the first day that a bluegrass unlimited magazine came through our mail slot and dropped through. It was just like being on an island, you know, it's like <laughs> shipping a you know, map in a bottle thing. <laughs> so so I'm reading That's through cute, this man. and then it starts mentioning in there that there's a banjo magazine that had just started called Banjo Newsletter. I mean, you know, so it's like this little corner ad. It's talking about this banjo, God, just a magazine only on the banjo. Yeah. Call that guy. Turns out it's in Annapolis, you know, just an hour from home. I didn't run right down there or anything, but I signed up and got subscription to Banjo Newsletter. So now I'm absorbing information. Right. You know, learning about things, but I mean, it's all new to me and it's, you know, so, and then a, a, a couple of landmark books had come out around that time. There was an Earl Scruggs book that had been out for a number of years, and then a, a book by a guy named Pete Wernick called Bluegrass Banjo that just came out right as I started to play, 1974. I'd started in the fall of 73, but 74, this brand new book that was amazing. I mean, not only covering all the styles, but so well written. This, uh, Pete Wernick is a very intelligent, college educated guy who could really wrote the book very well. And he had a lot of chapters in there about instruments, about setup, about buying instruments, about vintage instruments on top of the list. I read that stuff every night. I mean, in my school books, you know, <laughs> dust gathering in the corner, I'm reading banjo newsletter and <laughs> bluegrass banjo every night before I go to bed and, you know, just eat. So all this stuff was like happening 
right then. Amazing. I mean, just as I got in at that critical time of 73, 74, these certain things were happening right. on the scene at that time. And back to that magazine, it mentioned that there's a festival. And I saw all these names of towns and places I'd never heard of, but it said there was a bluegrass festival in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. It's like, if I know where that is, we we've right. taken family trips up there. It's like, I'll go to that one. I just got my driver's license just a couple of months before. So it was my first sort of trip by myself out of town. And I didn't know what to expect. I had no idea. I brought a sleeping bag and a lawn chair. So you just drove there by yourself? <laughs> drove there by myself, went up there. It was like a weekend festival. You know, and I went up there on Saturday morning and stayed till Sunday afternoon. And uh, and then I heard, you know, some really super influential bands, people I'd sort of heard the names of, but didn't know much about. But here was a chance to hear these groups up front and, mm. and in person. And it just floored me. Very cool. Yeah. So, so how did you start getting gigs now? That all came later. Again, here's here's another bit of uh by the way, there was, that festival had one band in particular, J.D. Crow in the New South, that was a huge influence and really was a turning point and absolutely setting in stone, this is what I want to do. We can get back into that a little bit later. Also in that magazine, I, it, it had classifieds, the Bluegrass magazine. Sure. So I thought, well, man, you know, I see ads in here for instruments and all, but once in a while someone will put an ad in like, hey, I'm looking for someone to pick with in Pittsburgh or whatever. So I put a little ad in there. I've only been playing a year and a half. I put a little ad in there. I want a um, banjo picker in Baltimore. Want to, looking for other banjo players to play with just for fun, strictly for fun. Call Mike, you know. And I got a few calls, and it's usually old. You know, it wasn't anybody my age. Right. Um, but it's like some college guys and a few older guys that would go over to their house and they were very nice and they had more playing experience, but they appreciated that I was into it, but I could only play maybe five songs, you know, but, you know, get together. And at one of the places was a, I went to a house and all spread out all over the coffee table was coming soon, Baltimore bluegrass music store. Ah, you know, it's like, good Lord, a bluegrass music store is about to open in Baltimore. So you were like, if, uh, and I was nuts. like, what is this all about? And they said, yeah, we're opening a bluegrass store. And uh, the guy who I went to see at that house, he sort of dropped out of it. But the guy who's sitting on the floor putting papers together, Steve Cunningham, was the guy that started this store in November of 75. That was my going into my senior year of high school. And I was there on, you know, the, the second day that it opened. Did you, you know, get a job going, working there or? What's that? Did you wind up working there or something? Or? I ended up, well, yeah, my summer job in at, right out of high school was going to be just, I'm going to take a year off and, and work in a bluegrass store. And I took uh, 24 years off. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> I mean, I literally, when that store closed in July of, of 2000, I locked the door at six o'clock. I was the last one out. Wow. <laughs> wow so that was wow okay yeah i mean the owner was there the whole time i mean he he, he, he i didn't own the store i was manager vice president general manager and all that but uh the owner decided he he wanted to get on to some different things so he got out of you know wanted to sell sell out and, and sell the store so that so must have been a great networking place for you to well, meet. Well, exactly. So that's yeah. how the thing came along okay so that's how you know by going there going to jam sessions and I was so shy. I couldn't even join in on a jam session. Didn't know anything about it, but I'm learning it, it, and getting exposed to this environment. And then eventually, yes. In fact, the owner had been in a band and he was getting ready to get out of the band so he could put more time into the store. So I started filling in and being okay. able to play a couple of gigs with that group. And it was a local band called Windy Ridge. And it was, um, I mean, they, they had a steady bar gig at really the place in town called the cub hill Inn. it was like that that was like the the bluegrass spot and so that was it you know it was just like getting in with a band not not only getting in with the store that came through that magazine or exposure to that magazine that led me to the guys who were starting that store but then working at the store part-time in high school full-time right out of high school and then eventually into my first band and that's where that's where the seeds were sown right so you kept and and through being in the store your knowledge of bluegrass and banjo in particular just exploded 
Totally. Yeah. And that's all okay. I thought about. I mean, yeah. it's just, uh, I was just, you know, I was reading catalogs all day. Yeah. Looking at parts and, you know, just absorbing this information and then, and then, you know, reading this Bluegrass Unlimited magazine every month, we carried the magazine. I would just like read, who are these people? What is, what's this, you know? And a, and a book would come out every now and again about the music and I would just eat that up. And that's another thing that was happening at that time. New magazines were coming out. There was a okay. magazine called Pickin' Magazine that started in 74. And it became Fret's Magazine. That was another magazine based oh, yeah. off of Guitar Player Magazine. Sure started something called frets i think around the late 70s 78 79 or something is that still around no it it, they lasted about 10 years i think the last issue was around 89 okay but again oh my gosh and then so and that was much more technically oriented the other magazines well bluegrass unlimited was more personality based Hmm. Pickin was a little bit of a crossover of personality but talking about instruments and maybe some tips on set up or whatever and then frets was wholly more technical right you know okay. personality you know uh, articles about great players and all that but also much more tech driven sure super helpful of course you know yeah there was no well, internet there's no youtube back then man. the dark ages yeah man it's so, it's the dark it's so funny to think isn't it funny to think about uh, how difficult things were then but they got done but you know compared to like how much opportunity is out there now? Well, it really is. I mean, that we talk about that stuff all the time. And of course, I had advantages that the early guys didn't at all. I mean, the, the pioneers of the music had really no advantages other than they were raised around it, loved it, and right. figured out how to play it and work their way through it. Then what they call the second generation of bluegrass musicians who heard Earl Scruggs and Bill Monroe in the forties, they heard those guys and they started getting interested in playing and they started figuring this stuff out, but they only had records. Yeah. You might see them in live performance and pick up a thing or two, but other than that, it was slowing down records, no teachers, no information on where to get a finger pick. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean those guys really had to slog through zero input. You know what I mean? I mean, that, that's, yeah. But you know what? There's easy. always like, I remember going to record stores as a kid in the uh, early to mid seventies and you'd find other people and like, Hey man, who sing, you know, who, who sings this song? Who else do you think I should listen to if I like the, you know, it's yeah. like gathering around music stores was a big, I mean, huge thing. Yeah. I can imagine that. Yeah. But, and, and see, that's what made Baltimore bluegrass so special because the regular generic music store would be great for pop guitar music, players yeah piano, right electric guitar or drums but if you wanted wanted information on a banjo <laughs> I mean, the first banjo i bought was at a place like that and they uh they weren't mean or anything but they knew less than i did about it. yeah sure sure <laughs> it's just I yeah. knew absolutely nothing and they right. knew even less you know because that wasn't their main thing they just happened to have one there on the wall you know and, and i could tell I didn't know much about it, but I thought, man, it just didn't really sound very good, but I, hell, I could hardly play, so I didn't know. But they didn't know either, you know? So, But anyway, when a Baltimore Bluegrass opens, it's like, wow, here's a place for people who are into this music who can gather and come and just hang on a Tuesday afternoon and just yak about music. Right. And Friday nights, back in the early days, we were had jam sessions Friday and Saturday night. We were open late. We were open noon to 10. Wow. Monday through Saturday, and... Uh, you know, and then hours changed later and it was a Friday night jam session. But either way, it was the it was the ground zero in Baltimore. I mean, that's right. like if you wanted a band, you called Baltimore Bluegrass. If you wanted to know who's playing somewhere, people called us. Yeah, I'm you know? sure. So we were like the place where you dropped off your flyers and advertised where you're playing because it was, you know, that in the from 75 to 1980, that was like the only game in town. Yeah, and it was such a tight niche. You probably Very attracted tight. anybody yes. that was ever, anybody that was anybody probably came by there, man. Yeah, to some extent, we didn't necessarily get celebrities coming through. We were still pretty well off that radar. I mean, I do remember, you know, it seemed like in the '80s, once in a while, somebody sort of a celebrity player might stop by or happen through, but it was really super vital to the local 
and regional zone. Because yeah. as it turned out, there were some other stores like it throughout the country, not many. I mean, you literally could count them on one hand. There was one yeah, in sure. San Francisco. There was one in Michigan, Elderly Instruments. There was Bucks County Folk Music up in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania yeah. uh, there was one in uh, Virginia, Picker Supply. But man, I don't think there were too many others. Yeah. I mean, this is, I'm talking about mid seventies. Sure. Sure. So, sure. you know, later on that, you know, the other things picked up and, you know, there was more exposure to some bigger stores and vintage instruments and whatnot. But anyway, it was, it was really vital in our area to have that and super vital to me. Yeah. Coming yeah. Out of high school, you know, wondering what am I going to do? And suddenly this guy says, well, Hey, this guy's pretty enthusiastic about playing. I'll hire him to work part-time. So Steve gave me a job which was a great thing, the nice thing he did because I didn't know anything. I didn't know how to operate a cash register or anything like that, you know? So I had to start pretty much from ground zero, but I did it part-time, but literally I graduated at one o'clock on a Saturday afternoon and I was at the store at three. So you were, uh, you were really committed. I, yeah. You know, it's like no summer vacation, no nothing. It didn't matter. I just went, went right to work in that store and I was there full-time all in. How much of that was work ethic? How much of that was passion? Mostly passion. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's wonderful, man. It was mostly passion. That's you know, really I, cool. I, all I wanted to do was be able to play. Yeah. And I just knew that if I was going to be able to do this at all, well, number one, I needed a job. Number two, I wanted to be around it. So, yeah, I, I, I you know, quite honestly, I can, I come up short sometimes on the work ethic thing, and uh, you pay the price for that. But at the same time, I, I, I feel like I did my job, but I, I learned. Hmm. I was sound. Definitely, it was the passion that was yeah. really the driving force. I just yeah. wanted to be in that building. I wanted to be around it from noon to 10. And, you know, it wasn't like I was just sitting there playing. Sure, you have some, you know, a little off time. You can pull a banjo off the wall and play around, but you had jobs to do. Of course, yeah, of course. It was a small two man operation, sometimes three. It was, we're not talking about. You know, it wasn't like Manny's music or something. <laughs> <You know? laughs> this, this is a small deal. But we had a job to do, and we did right. it. Yeah, right. I think we did it a good job. Tell, all right, tell me. Uh, uh, let's. I'm going to skip a little bit. Musically, what were the what are the top three musical interactions that you've had that have been the most memorable to you? So you're talking about direct personal playing interactions. Yeah, it could be studio, could be live, could be just someone came in the store and sat with you for two hours and just changed your life or something. Yeah, um, these would not be necessarily household names known outside of bluegrass. No, whatever you want can be whatever you want. I just I'm looking yeah. for like the things that like yes. knee, knee jerk reaction to that question for you. Like these are the three things that yeah. touched my heart the the, the deepest. Yeah, well, well, I would say one of them would be there's a fiddler in the Baltimore area, John Glick, um, who has played with uh, some great bands, the Del McCurry band. He was in that band in the in the 80s, uh, but in the 70s he was mostly playing around the Baltimore area and some regional bands. And he would come into the store and get you know, to drop off the bow to uh, get his bow rehaired for his fiddle. But I, again, going back to 1974 and hearing things, I went to a, a concert in Baltimore and heard, I didn't know who this guy was, but I loved his fiddling. And I didn't know anything about fiddle. I wasn't even really drawn to the fiddle that much. But I remember being, that his fiddle playing to me sounded like this guy Vassar Clements on mm -hmm. the Old and the Way album. I thought, it sounds like that. But I really didn't know. But there was something about that I really liked. I, you know, as time went on, I realized it wasn't just a ripoff of Vassar. It was John's own thing. And he was this intensely rhythmic, bluesy player that had he had sort of a gypsy jazz flavor in it. But but he had the raw kick and bluegrass things with just unbelievable. I mean, just dripping with soul, passion and fire. And I just was, I loved his playing and I knew nothing. I just thought that something about this guy's playing is so unusual. And it was totally unrecorded at that time. It wasn't like, well, I can go out and buy 10 albums of this guy. He hadn't recorded. Um, you just saw him uh, playing in town. I saw him playing in town and sometimes he would come into the store and he would just play a little bit, try out a fiddle or something and just play. And it was like, again, jaw on the floor, just 
on just hearing him just playing little snippets of things or a tune and I just couldn't get enough of it. And I can, and I ended up being in a band with him oh, years cool. later, a local band. We, we've worked a lot together and every time we got together and play, and even to this day, we don't play as much now, but um, to this day, his playing is incredibly influential to me and it touches me in a really deep, deep, in the bones place that uh, is really nothing quite like it. That's and I've been pretty cool. Struck by that also by other great players and, but people that I would see at concert and not necessarily get a chance to play with, hmm. but that's one, I have to say one in particular that really stands out um, on another instrument, you know, that just uh, absolutely killed me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, what else? Uh, Tony mm -hmm. Rice, great guitar player. We just lost Tony yeah. uh, just recently. Did he pass um, from COVID? Don't know. Nobody, mm -hmm. nobody really knows uh, for sure. The family's keeping that pretty private. Um, yeah, I saw him play at the very first festival I went to at Gettysburg in 74. I didn't know who he was. I had not heard the name. He had not recorded yet at that time. He wasn't oh, on wow. an album yet. As it turns out, he had recorded an album, but it wasn't even out yet. I didn't get the out his guitar album didn't come out till like a month later. But his guitar playing and singing, I was really drawn to this guy, JD Crow, great banjo player. So I was totally into JD and learning his stuff and going after his stuff. Um, and then I hear this guy on on guitar, and I really had not been interested in guitar until I heard this guy. You know, I heard electric guitars. I heard acoustic guitars. Like, yeah, it's okay. You know, it's good stuff. And everybody else loves it. There's nothing wrong with it. But I heard this guy and I'm like, oh my gosh, what is this? And again, knowing nothing. I didn't know about the whole background. Anybody who wants to delve into this player, Tony Rice, who may not be familiar with this name. There's a, he has an autobiography. There's uh, tons of information on the internet, plenty of YouTube footage. He has a number of classic albums, Manzanita, Cold on the Shoulder, Church Street Blues, Backwaters. He did more than straight bluegrass. He did a lot of sort of new acoustic instrumental, jazzy instrumentals, really extraordinary player. Anyway, he played with great tone, great feel. And I was struck by that right away. I didn't know what I was listening to, but it really hammered me right away. I didn't know what it was, but I was absolutely drawn in like a magnet to his playing and i hadn't played guitar yet i was started on banjo got into guitar maybe a two, couple of years later through hearing him i had no interest in guitar until i heard that guy yeah and was so he in new grass revival no but he for a minute was really tight with sam bush sam bush was the right leader okay of new grass revival and when sam bush and tony rice were gosh, still, you know, late teens, early 20s, they met and played in a group called the Bluegrass Alliance okay. in Louisville, Kentucky. This is around 1970, 71. And then Sam Bush started Newgrass Revival that branched off of that band. Tony Rice went and joined J.D. Crow in Lexington, Kentucky, and that was J.D. Crow in the New South. And that's, I mean, I could, could talk all day about that band, but there's a lot of that history online if anybody wants to delve into the impact and the importance of that group. Sure. And why that was so vital with Ricky Skaggs, Tony Rice, J.D. Crow, Jerry Douglas, Bobby Sloan on bass. Um, it, it was like one of those very impactful albums that really changed the course of bluegrass history to some extent. And there have been others like that, too. Anyway, so Tony Rice, that would definitely be one of those guys that sort of in the back of my mind at all times. And um, I would say J.D. Crow would be the other. Now, I didn't get a chance to play with J.D. He's a banjo player and he has a band. It's not going to be likely a chance to sit down yeah. with him. But his music has really, really hit me on just the command and authority that he played with and great tone, touch, timing. And he was known for great rhythm. And that was absolutely my weakest point. On banjo. Absolutely. When I started playing music, I had absolutely no rhythm. I had 15 left feet. <laughs> 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 when it comes to, I mean, I couldn't dance. I mean, this is, I'm just, I'll lay it all out and tell you this right now. The reason I was so drawn to him was because everybody said, man, listen to this guy. He has the best timing. And I had absolutely the worst. 
I mean, the worst. I, I couldn't play four notes in a row in any kind of rhythm. I didn't, hadn't even tried wow. a metronome. I had not one shred of rhythm inside me. Interesting. <laughs> I mean, I can tell you this. I'm quite, I, I, I didn't know where you tap your foot. I had no idea when you listen to music, you tap your foot like on, on a downbeat. I, I didn't know. How did you work on that? I mean, I had uh, by listening to this guy. Yeah. And, and lessons, you know, I took lessons later from some other people that really helped straighten me out. Metronome, you had to have a met, you must have worked with a metronome. No, not right away. I couldn't even attempt that. Oh, wow. When I started, when, when this buddy taught me, he would just show me where to put my fingers and how to, you know, learn something out of a book, but he wasn't really checking to see how well I was doing. And so he, he sort of quit and I was on my own learning out of books. And when I started playing, uh, you know, and uh, not with a band or anything close to that. But when I had put that ad in the magazine mm. and started going to other people's houses, you know, they were very nice. I mean, we could play a little bit and they point out a few things. Hey, you might want to try this or that. And I went to this one guy's place and I started playing Foggy Mountain Breakdown. And I thought I was really getting it. I, mean, <laughs> I, I, was, I was like, you know, fingers really moving and but just as a little backup on that, I, other than this kid, I never saw anybody play a banjo. I only got it out of books. I didn't see where the hands were or what you're supposed to do. Okay. It was so you never yeah. get a picture now and again, but I couldn't, I hadn't seen, I, was, I couldn't go to a bar. That's a huge setback. Well, it's kind of, well, a setback. Yeah. I didn't think about it that I much. I mean, no, but I mean, not knowing so, but like it's, it's, yeah. it's, yeah, it's, it's a big. Yeah. I didn't see it. I mean, yeah. Again, the, had sometimes rough pictures or is you know just sort of a little black and white photo of a hand but it didn't really register so anyway which is it's really important because even like i'm if yeah. i when i'm taking lessons and we're just on zoom my teacher and i and he'll be like hey move your hand here and like oh yes. that makes a huge difference sometimes if you're struggling with a particular thing and it's like oh that makes sense great i, I do that all the time when it lessons yeah. like one-on-one lessons or zoom but yeah in person, it's like, man i can i zone right in on the right hand and, and position on that kind of thing. But anyway, so I, you know, I go to this one guy's house and I'm playing my foggy mountain breakdown and he grabs the neck of my banjo. <laughs> I remember that he just sort of reached over and he grabbed the neck and he said, Mike, and I go, yeah. He said, you've got to start all over. You've got to go back to page one and start from the very beginning. <laughs> Oh my God! You and must man, be I devastated. You, I almost passed out. I remember I could feel like blood, like just drain out of my head. I was like, "What?" I, you know, this is before the store. This is before I hadn't met anybody else. Um, you know, I, I was like, "God, I did really?" It's. He it said, "Yeah, man. Just, there's. You have absolutely no timing, no rhythm, at all. I wow. mean, at." all you've got to you've got to figure out where a downbeat is hey well, where an upbeat is i'm like well tell me and he's like here you just go mm, ch mm, ch and i i couldn't even do that i wasn't like oh yeah okay i see don't jump mm, you know it's like what how do you how do you go up you know really i'm telling you i mean just absolutely no all i had was the desire right but really no native um skills <laughs> in, that, that's, in that direction but i was really drawn to the rhythm of the music but i didn't know why i thought man it just sounds great it's driving and exciting and i love the sort of the tempo of it and the, you know, all of that but i didn't uh, have any the vaguest idea about timing and rhythm so i was sort of drawn to players that were known for timing okay and as turns out this guy john glick on the fiddle known for that Tony Rice on the guitar, known for that. J.D. J.D. Crow, Crow. Banjo, who yeah. I really focused on early on because I was only learning banjo, known as a great timing and rhythm player, aside from his leads and overall music sound. So I was like, well, that's the guy. That's who I need to laser focus on what that guy is all about if I'm going to get a handle on this. Because that was absolutely, I mean, among my other weaker points, <laughs> you know, it was absolutely the weakest point was like, no sense of rhythm yeah so that was huge and uh that that's how i learned you know and then uh, and then you know other instructors at the store people who had more experience could they pointed the way to things well you need to yeah, get a metronome try this and all that and by then i was starting to get a handle on it 
Okay. I, mean, I didn't have great rhythm or anything after two or three years, but I could, I could stay in time or, you know, I was still was speeding up and slowing down and all that, but I could sort of figure out how to play rhythm and back up. And then I started getting the guitar and figuring out how to just play a rhythm stroke. And I think guitar rhythm, you know, learning, I got way into guitar, particularly this Tony Rice style guitar. And by doing that a lot, that's helped okay. get a sense of basic downbeat, upbeat, and all that kind of thing. So, you just, so some of this, it sounds like it's just like recognizing it and then focusing on it and just paying totally. attention to it now. Well, As because opposed... I was really loving it. I thought I really want to do this. And it, yeah. it's been pointed out to me that that is something you better get a handle on. I mean, they weren't mm -hmm. reprimanding me on it, but this, this one guy in particular is like, man, you've got to have that. You got to you have Art to on page develop one. a sense of rhythm <laughs> timing, especially on this instrument. The band bluegrass banjo is a big part of it is the rhythmic aspect. You're part of the rhythm. Effectively, that's a rhythm instrument, really, man. Well, it's, well, it's, you can, it's you a can even look at it. A from percussive. Another, it's, a, it's basically a drum. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a percussion a instrument. With, yeah, with, and it has a percussive kind of a tonality, but it's, it is much more than that. It's as melodic as any instrument. Um. And those styles were coming along and being developed in the 70s as well. But at first, it was really this sense of trying to stay in time and be rhythmic. Yeah. Yeah, bluegrass in general does have a heavy emphasis on rhythm. But there is so much more to it. There's, It's not all fast picking. I mean, I, that's what I thought it was early on, too. But it realized it's, you know, there's gospel. There's a blues aspect. There's trio singing and beautiful duet singing and the way that voices blend with instruments and how it's all crafted together is, you know, each instrument has its vital role to play in it. Yeah. And I learned all that later. That all came in little, you know, first heavy into the banjo, then the guitar, really heavy into guitar and, and then just absorbing it and learning about it, you know, through the years. But those first five years were super formative you know, what you guys do like now in Frank Sullivan and Dirty Kitchen. Um, I have to tell you, man, that's not blowing smoke. That's pretty phenomenal the way. I mean, you would think you guys have been together for like 20 years, man. It's it's yeah. there's a tightness there. Oh, yeah. you guys are locked in. And even like there's certain runs where you and Frank or you and Chris, like I was listening to the record, the last record. And I was like, holy shit, I had to play it again because it's oh. like. Well, I mean, it's like you're doing a run of, you know, two to four measures and it's in, you know, you're playing eighth notes or 16th or 32nd mm -hmm. notes even. Right. And, and the, the parody, I know you're not, you can't go in there and overdub that stuff. It's just too fast. But to have you guys execute like that, that's phenomenal, man. As a, I appreciate uh, that. It's, uh, I was blown away. No, I really do appreciate that. We, yeah, um, we love that kind of stuff. And, and, and to be quite honest, we're not pioneers in that by any means. Newgrass Revival. Right. I had Pat Flynn on this show. That back in the mid-70s, they were already <laughs> like already a lot of that happening. And once Bela Fleck joined Newgrass in the early 80s, there was a lot of that that was laid down before us. But and you're not it, doing it exclusively on Bluegrass, which to that's me... That's right. At that I, time, they were the only guys. That, well, uh, uh, in early 70s, there was one band playing like that. Then there were a few others coming along in the 70s. And then there were groups like David Grisman Quintet mm -hmm. that were playing, you know, not with a banjo, but they had two mandolins, guitar, fiddle, and bass. And there was a lot of intricate unison and harmony and locked-in phrasing and all this kind of stuff that was coming from other influences jazz influences and a new acoustic scene was developing where a lot of this was was coming along so you know we were hearing that and we were all influenced by by the music that was developing then and music that they were developing off of their sources mm. um you know this was a new sound this david grisman quintet music that came along in the mid 70s out of the san francisco area and it was like a bomb went off that set off a huge movement brought in a lot of young players who were really they were very adept at playing bluegrass on several instruments and then they were drawn to this new sound that opened up those kind of possibilities of yeah different chord progressions different kinds of melodies and uh extended soloing all this stuff again 
had its origins elsewhere, but they fused it together in a new form that made it accessible to people who were playing banjos, mandolins, and guitars. Well, that's and, what I uh, like most about Dirty Kitchen. It's yeah. it's very tangible. You don't have to be a diehard bluegrass fan. Right. You're, it's very accessible music, man. And yeah. I, like to me, like I said, you're like almost like a rock. You're like the Eagles in the 70s, except you got a mandolin and a banjo. That, to me, I mean, that's why I, I love it so much. Yeah, yeah well, it was, there's a lot of that now. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, and I appreciate that. And I feel like I'm proud of our sound and uh, Frank's songwriting and, you know, the style of music we go for. And I think, you know, we have our own sound and touches on things. To totally. Our arrangements, I really very proud of our arrangements you know we we really work hard on those and you know, I, I feel like those really are our arrangements but they are there's influence yeah you no know? i mean just uh, just quite honestly i, I don't want I, I just feel like it, I, i'll tell you this i feel very strongly about always naming my sources go ahead man i really do because because uh, sometimes you'll see people oh yeah we got this whole new thing and it's all mine <laughs> no but you have your own yeah, style like, for sure you know, very little stuff comes completely out of the thin air. There are some things, I mean, you have to think a guy like Art Tatum, I mean, what, who was he listening to and how did he get right. that? That's a pretty much extraordinary out of the thin air thing to, to my ear. I have no idea what he listened to when he was five, but, um, but as far as this music, there's been, a, there've been a lot of bands, especially in the last 20 years. I mean, look at a group like the Punch Brothers, they're doing a right. of Chris Thiele. And there's a whole movement there. And of course, what Newgrass started in the 70s and 80s. And I mean, just too many to count. Sure. But they're uh, the string dusters. I mean, there are plenty of, of great groups, but we're all different. We yes. all have our own identity in terms of our choice of material, how we arrange it, how we present it. So that's our own take. Sure. For sure. You know, your style of doing it. But it's, but as far as that accessible thing, there were bands in the 60s and 70s already starting to do that. Uh, there was a group called the Country Gentlemen in Bluegrass. They were sort of the first band. They started in the late 50s to start doing folk songs. And this is during the folk boom of the 60s. They were like, hey, we, we need to do more than just play bluegrass songs that are really sort of come from one identifiable background and appeal to just one identifiable base it's like if we want to play elsewhere or whatever colleges we need to play things that people are hearing on the radio pop maybe a pop tune once in a while they were sort of one of the first bands to do that some other sort of established bluegrass bands started to do touch a little bit on that even flat and scrubs it's not known as their strongest material they're they're uh, revered materials, their original, early, traditional stuff. That's what a, the, the bluegrass fan really loves. But they even tried doing, you know, Bob Dylan songs or whatever in the 60s. Frankly, it didn't really, that's not their best material. But already the mindset was, we need to do something beyond the material that we've been doing. So already the seeds were already sown on that direction mm. in the 60s. And that's where that's where Sam Bush, as a teenager, heard a couple of established bluegrass bands doing more than just playing songs, you know, about, you know, Cabin Home on the Hill. And that's not denigrating that material at all. That's strong, you know, passionate music about where this music came from. But but to go, well, OK, maybe you could do a Beatles tune. There was actually a band from Boston that did a an album in the 60s, Charles River Mountain Boys or something, Charles River Valley Boys. They did all Beatles tunes, a bluegrass band. That's funny, man. And uh, well, you guys did an arrangement of like, like try that. And it was sort of an underground hit within bluegrass. Nobody outside of bluegrass would know much about it. But but it's like their thought was, well, I mean, that's the hottest thing on the radio in 1965. Right. Let's, uh, let's try to play some of this stuff. And they did sort of up-tempo bluegrass style. And then um, Newgrass Revival comes along. And then they're like, wow, let's do a Leon Russell song. Or let's do a Rolling Stones thing. Or let's do... And it can be done. And they were sort of the first band, I would say, that was able to do it convincingly. A lot to do with Sam. But the personnel in the band, that, that early band, had such integrity in their their um 
their mission. Yeah, their passion. To play for, yeah. music well and not do it in a, you know, sort of like, well, let's just try it as a gimmick. Nothing was a gimmick with these guys. It was like, that's a damn good song. Let's do it. Yeah, that could be done on a banjo. And sure enough, we can jam the hell out of this thing for and play this for ten minutes. You know, jam out on two chords. Sure. And you know, they were hearing Almond Brothers and all the stuff that was going on in the '60s or whatever, and they were able to go, "Yeah, we can do that. We can make that happen." And it, in in a convincing fashion, and it proved to be a huge, major guiding light to like, yeah, you know. Yeah. Yeah it can branch in that direction. So that's why I say th those kind of bands helped make it more accessible to outside ears. Yes, for sure, man. Yeah. Uh, let's shift for a minute. Yeah. Tell, tell me uh, any low points or dark <laughs> periods you've had to deal with over the course of your life and how'd you get through them? Well, I saw that I, you know, one that, that sticks out to me almost in a funny way, but it wasn't so damn funny at the time. <laughs> Isn't that funny how that works? <laughs> funny how that works. And I've been uh, playing <laughs> a few years <clears throat> and just uh, I was seeing a girlfriend for a few months and it was you know, pretty serious, but she moved away, moved out of town. So I was like really, you know, sort of heartbroken, you know, that kind of thing at that time so you know you're going through that and I, I remember this one specific gig it was on an easter sunday night and it was a good band a good good local band in baltimore and we um we played easter sunday night from nine to two. Oh my god and, and i remember the uh you know the ten commandments remember they used to always show the ten commandments on sunday night easter sunday that was on the tv in the bar <laughs> like just sort of like over the bar and there was one guy at the bar, the bartender reading the paper. And then this guy with his arms down, sleeping on the bar, that was the only guy in the bar besides the five of us. Oh my God. <laughs> wow. And, and here this girl had just like, you know, flown, you know, thousands of miles away. And I remember going out in the alley, <laughs> the alley where my car was parked after the first set thinking, man, have I made a terrible decision here <laughs> playing a gig to one drunk dude in no, not, not just for the gig but like in life yeah maybe i should have gone to you know school or mm. maybe i should have um you know do i need to make it a, a, a huge u-turn here because man is is this it is this you know i'm like 22 at the time i'm thinking hmm uh, Huh. Gotta play five hours to. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one. Yeah, it's a tough one, and I was like, oh boy. Uh. Yeah. So anyway, you know, I can look at, at that laugh, man. I wasn't laughing then. I was. Yeah. Like, I, was, I was really depressed on a number of levels, and you know, I'm struggling to play too. You know, it wasn't like I had it all together by any yeah. means. You know, I just, as far as I know, this is pretty much it. I'm just gonna be, you know, doing that and. It wasn't like all bar gigs are like that. The, the, the reason I picked that one out was because it was Easter Sunday and everybody else is having family dinners and all yeah, that. And yeah, and you're sitting there playing. Bar, to, and there's yeah. one guy at the bar who's asleep, and and it just felt, you know, well, it's it, easy it just to felt really low. It's easy to look and say, "Oh my God, is this going to be in ten years from now doing the same thing, or twenty years?" Yeah, from now? because yeah. I had seen some of that. I mean, of course, yeah. I'd seen the lively Friday and Saturday nights where places are packed and everything's exciting. Sure, that was still going on. Yeah. So it wasn't like, well, there was no other game in town. Sure. There were those things, but I wasn't thinking that at the time because it was combined with this girl moving away. But aside from that. It was sort of, I had seen other musicians, older guys who were playing in older local bands, and I had walked in on sometimes Sunday afternoon gigs that they were doing with five people there. And, you know, here I'm in my early 20s, they're in their mid 40s, and I'm like, man, is that, is, is that it? Yeah. Is that really, you know, that's, and that just wasn't looking really appealing to me at the time. You know, I don't know how they felt about it, but I just know that I, that looked really dim. Yes. And, but there were other avenues that were happening, fortunately, like there were bluegrass festivals that were coming on the scene. And so there were plenty of, 
good outdoor activities. It wasn't always in dark, smoky bars. And, and even the bar thing could be very different. It could be a very dingy, smoky bar, or it could be, you know, a nicer, more lit place, even sometimes a family-oriented yeah. kind of a thing. So there was some of that that was merging at that time. So, so th there was hope. There were yeah. rays of hope that, okay, this isn't the, the only game in town. There, uh, there are other things that are going on. There are things going on in other parts of the country that I wasn't even really that aware of, but I knew that there were great festivals and the Telluride Festival in Colorado was you know, a major thing that I hadn't even gone to yet, but heard about as legendary. And I thought, okay, it's not all just smoky bars. There, there are great bands playing in beautiful places, wonderful festivels. So there's, there's, there is a lot of hope so you're able but to pull, would, pull yourself out of dark, it. That sort of dark phase, that really, that one really stands out because I really wanted to play, but I wasn't sure if I was really willing to play it on those terms. On those terms, to, forever. To, to my last breath. Yeah, which is you pretty know, reasonable. And I had nothing else. It wasn't like, okay, well, I'll go back to art school or, yeah, okay, I'll go back and learn to be a pilot or something. <laughs> yeah. Know? Or I'll go back to my job flying for Southwest. It's like, no. You know, this is it. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And I didn't. I had no interest. Nothing that was even remotely close as a second place. Sure. So I was like, well, I got to stick this out. You know, I'm gonna have to. I'll find a way, somehow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that is a low point. L let me ask you, for guitar players listening who want to start playing banjo, who might want to start experimenting, what are the Two, what are the biggest differences between those two instruments as far as learning curve? And also, what would you recommend to them if they're looking to get involved with a banjo? Well, first, I would start with what, what, what is the similarity? The similarity is that the banjo being tuned in G tuning, your second, third, and fourth strings are the same as the guitar. Okay. So anything you do on the guitar on the second, third, and fourth string can be done immediately on the banjo. Okay. So that's DG, where it ends. Okay. That, that, that's a similar, that's the similarity. Now, now we hit a brick wall. <laughs> but it's something. But it's something because even if it's a guy who's never seen a banjo before, but he can play the hell out of a guitar, he can already start make, doing something on a banjo. Yeah, plenty of inversions with those three. Plenty of inversions, yeah. but, but just even all the information that's on the, you know, the, the B, G, and D string, you know, you can at least play some chords and. Yeah anything you know or a bit of a scale now the first string is a d instead of an e so you're you have to think differently there the fifth string is a mystery at first it's like good lord why is this highest string next to the lowest one why is it running only halfway up the neck right right it's weird for me the guitar was weird because it didn't have the fifth string on it so okay. i came in from banjo to guitar but um there are a couple of things if someone has had some finger picking experience on guitar they'll at least have some facility in the right hand to be able to do that. That's helpful. Um, as far as it, getting your feet wet first, there are a couple of ways of looking at that. There are guitar banjos. It's basically a banjo body. Actually, technically you call it banjo guitar. In other words, whatever the body is, the neck uh, configuration is the next thing. So a banjo body with a guitar neck on it. Oh, they that's actually weird. had these things back in the 20s. They had banjo orchestras. It would have a five-string neck, a tenor, a short tenor neck, a mandolin neck. Wow. A guitar neck, and even a cello <laughs> or some kind of a cello banjo. I think that's pretty rare. There was even, of all things, a bass banjo, like a big bass drum with four strings on it. Anyway, there is a company, um, Deering, I think, makes one, and a company called Gold Tone that actually makes this banjo guitar and you it's strung and played like a guitar, but it's the tone of a banjo. Wow. So this would be, if someone just wanted to get that tone, they just like the sort of twangy, and I don't mean it in a derogatory way, but there's a, there's a snappy twang. Yeah. That's the banjo. The that it is the, the captivating thing that either pulls you in or drives you out. So you know, if you just want to kind of at least hear that, you could still strum it, hmm. play all your guitar stuff on it and see if that appeals to you. And that might even be enough. It might be like, yeah, okay, at least I'm not really playing the banjo. 
I'm just playing guitar, but it sounds more like a banjo. And to the guy off the street, they probably wouldn't know the difference. Interesting. But if you go, well, okay, I hear the difference. And sure enough, if I'm just strumming this thing, it's not bluegrass banjo. And it's not going to sound anything like dueling banjos or foggy mountain breakdown. It just can't possibly be. Right. Then you're going to have to, you know, get a good lesson from a good player. There's tons of great lessons online. Uh, I think that's a good resource. The problem with online is for someone really starting out, they may not be able to differentiate between lessons that are, you know, maybe not exactly right on point and really good lessons. So if you can seek out a player who's a good teacher, yeah, I agree with you. On show home. you to make that transition. So right on the spot, show you really how to wear the finger picks, how to place your hand. And a few basic things just to get the right hand mechanics, because that's really what it is. The left hand, I'll tell you, guitar players, speaking to you, guitar players, I don't know because I play some guitar. Um, man, it's a whole lot easier playing a banjo on the left hand than a guitar. Guitar really? is tough. Oh, hell yeah. Well, you got the bigger strings. Yes. And there's a lot more movement. I mean, you're really, it's a busy left hand for the most part. You'd be as amazed what you can do on the right hand on a banjo and with one finger on the left hand. Wow, that's make interesting. A ton as of well. music. Uh, I don't have my banjo here right in front of me, but maybe we could do this and pick it up another day and demonstrate something like that. But there's a tune called Cumberland Gap. It's a really, it's a really cool banjo tune. Literally one finger of the left hand. That's about my speed. It would be. It's ninety-eight percent <laughs> open strings, <laughs> but it's combinations of rolls and patterns on those open strings. That's okay. The magic. That's the work is getting that down smooth rolling patterns and understanding how they interlock and intersect um so it's deceptively simple and also you know isn't that interesting how certain things look harder but you do them and they're like man I, that kind of fell into my lap and then other things you go oh, man that looks like a breeze and then you go do it it's like holy shit you know that's, i say that that's not at all what i had in mind <laughs> This I Cumberland that, Gap tune, if you saw me play, you'd think, man, I could do that in five minutes. I mean, just give me a badge. I'll just, I'll do that too. You would have the left hand, not but, you personally. I'm just talking yeah, about yeah, yeah. you never played one. You know, you'd have that because you could just do this. I mean, you'd even go across one fret. You're not even moving up and down the neck. It's like at the second fret, fourth string, third string, first string, it's all there. But here's the deal. Yeah. Here's a deal that's going to take time. And it doesn't take 10 years, but it, but for someone who's been playing only with a flat pick, only strumming, it's going to feel like another animal. Yeah, totally. It's not done any finger picking at all. They're, they're going to, that's going to take a little time, but it doesn't take forever. And already having the advantage I think you have of coming from guitar is you already really have that rhythm. Yeah. yeah. Nothing else. You, you know, you just, you, you have the music, you have the rhythm in your, in your bones, in your ears. Now it's just a matter of getting this, you know, tactile, physical thing going on with the right hand. And I'll, I'll just tell people, if you're interested in uh, working with Mike to take some lessons, just shoot him an email. It's MM5ST at, right. as in M, uh, Mike Munford, five string, MM5ST at AOL.com. And uh, yeah. just let him know that you're interested in what you want to do. Um, favorite musicians you've enjoyed playing with? Well, I have that guy, John Glick, yep. right away. Um, well, I, I, just, I have to say it, and I'm not saying it because I have to, but but the guys in the band I'm yeah. playing with now, you know, I really certainly enjoy making music with them. Um, uh, God, I mean, they're just, they're really almost too many to okay. list because there are different styles to this music. There's another band I play with around here. We don't play that often, but we play a more traditional style of the music. Okay. And um, I can think of members of that band. Uh, well, one of them is just a, it's just a pickup band. We really don't rehearse, but we play traditional bluegrass that we're all familiar with. And there's a wonderful, another great fiddler in Baltimore, Warren Blair. He's an incredible fiddle player and I enjoy playing music with him tremendously but it's just it, they're just too many to mention i mean over the years i mean it's dozens and dozens of really great key players which is um, a good problem to have yeah it is a, it is a good problem to have absolutely 
Yeah. So, tell me your uh, top three Desert Island discs. No order, no particular order. Just I love that. Today. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, and I know I'm harping on Tony a, a lot. One is Tony Rice guitar, mm -hmm. and mostly because I got into that for the banjo playing of J.D. Crow, who I was really intensely into. Still love his playing, but it's a great album. And ironically, it's Mr. Rice's least favorite album, and he practically never mentioned it. And in his autobiography, he was like, oh, I wish I'd never done it. You know, but it's my favorite album because it was really actually it does have some wonderful qualities to it. Um, so that album. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned his other albums earlier for people who want to delve into his style. Yeah, Manzanita is a popular album. one. Manzanita. Yeah. Dirt Street Blues, Backwaters for the instrumental music, uh, Bluegrass Album Band. Uh, those uh, That series of albums, they're treasures too. Next album would be Flat and Scruggs complete Mercury sessions because Flat and Scruggs had played with Bill Monroe. And of course, you know, the early Bill Monroe Flat and Scruggs is vital to the history of the music, but for a banjo player to really, really get a feel for what Earl Scruggs was doing in his absolute prime when he was 24, 25, 26 years old in the late forties, it's uh, they laid the law down on material the way it was presented, the the um, but the banjo playing throughout everything, where it leads back up, variety of tempos, absolutely essential. And the third one, hmm. Oscar Peterson, Night Train. Right on, man. And I know zip about jazz. I mean, absolutely nothing. But but another one of those things that did happen when I was a kid. I remember watching TV somewhere and really loving this piano playing. And I just remember this big guy at the piano. It might have been on the Mike Douglas show or something. I just remember. That was a good show. This. I just remember this. I just I thought there was something about this. And then the name stuck. I just remember saying, that's Oscar Peterson. I just, wow. But I, again, at that age of 10, 11, it didn't occur to me to run to the store and find out who Oscar Peterson was. I just remember thinking, that's, that's the first piano playing I really liked. And... And then I, when I got into music, I'd been in a couple of years and ran into a guy who was a really good bluegrass musician. He was into different things. And I happened to mention that. He said, oh, my gosh, yeah, Oscar Peterson. Yeah, he's, you know, jazz giant. I mean, legendary, just, you know, a huge figure. And and I said, well, what would be a good album to get? I mean, get Night Train. Start with that. I'm going to check that out. I'd circle it and, and to it today. And, you know, this guy recorded 60 albums or whatever, but what I, but what's, there's a cut on there, Georgia on my mind, uh, Oscar Peterson trio. And this was Oscar Peterson with Ed Thigpen on drums and Ray Brown on bass. And I'm really not as deeply into jazz like Chris and a lot of other players are, or just people in general. I mean, I can appreciate it. But I'm not really drawn to the horns or the big band thing or, or a lot of that. But this was the trio, piano, bass, and drums. And that Georgia on my mind is just brings me to tears every time I hear it. It is so beautiful. But aside from that, Oscar's playing is so precise and blues laden. And this album in particular is heavy on more blues aspects than even hardcore jazz aspects other things get into crazy voicings and you know wonderful things but this album was a little more almost every tune heavy on a blues feel again going back to the rice thing see i didn't right. make these connections till later tony rice's guitar playing 98 percent blues feel heavy heavy on blues john glick's fiddle playing blues all the way and they didn't i'm gonna check that record out musicians. they just brought that aspect into the music very heavily yeah. into the music so that thread runs really heavily on all three of those on those recordings and well no not those recordings because flat and scruggs that was not really their sound their sound was not a bluesy bluegrass sound but as far as going back to the musicians yeah yeah the musicians that had the you know profound effect it was players that had a very noticeable blues inflection in their their music so anyway, as far as albums, Tony Rice guitar, Flat and Scruggs, Mercury Sessions, and uh, Oscar Peterson, Night, Night Train. Night Train. Very cool, man. Uh, tell me one or two changes you've made or one or two things that you've done that have had the biggest impact on your life. Could be 
personal growth, professionally, spiritually, uh, anything that was important to you and changed your life significantly? Hmm. You know, it's amazing. I, I, I think, you know, I feel like I'm not really very accomplished in the life thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, not so that I've had a terrible life by any means, but I'm not... Um, you know, the life has been centered around music, no question about it. And as totally. far as things that, that sort of fell into place in a positive way, I mean, the number one was that store. Yeah. Had that not come along, I'm not sure if I would have found my way in it. Excuse me. W work in Baltimore. I'm not sure how I would have found my, my way in because uh, I can tell you this. I mean, this is sort of a little bit off, tent, off track on that. I am the last person that ever thought they'd be doing anything on stage in front of anybody. You were that shy? Way shy. I mean, when how, I was learning you... to play at home, you know, I was in the basement. I had my little room in the basement down there, you know, just sort of a, like a rec room kind of a thing. And uh, if I heard somebody walk in the door, I stopped. I mean, I couldn't even, I couldn't even bear the thought of somebody even hearing it, you know, in the rest of the house. And, and then... Oh, yeah. I wasn't in the school play. I had no. How did you overcome this? Well, a, a combination of things being sort of forced in sort of like a sink or swim thing where suddenly you had to perform. I remember in our school, the senior year, we had this. Well, they had a thing at, at school called Talent Night. Mm -hmm. And you didn't necessarily have to do it, but I was sort of goaded into it by a couple of other guys who had heard me play a little bit. And they, they thought it was pretty cool. And uh, the. And one of them was a talented piano player. And he just said, man, let's do it. Let's play something. And I, I, re I remember I really liked House of the Rising Sun. Yeah, great. Song. I sort of figured out the chords. I couldn't really play the lead, but I could sort of play the chords along with him. And this is in front of a whole, you know, student, you know, upper, upper school and uh, parents and all that. And we just we didn't put on a show necessarily, but it was part of the show. And we just sat in chairs He at the piano. And I think some other guy was playing drums. And that was somehow I was able to do it. I, I was scared to death. I couldn't eat all day. I thought I was going to get sick, you know. I, uh, but um, somehow it went OK. I have no idea what that sounded like. Do you <laughs> still get the, do you still uh, get the jitters before you go on stage? You know, not as much. Um, I've, I've found a way to sort of like, you know, calm down. I don't tend to really get jitters, but early on, I surely did. I remember the first time playing in a bar, uh, and luckily it was, I was glad that it was a noisy, noisy bar. You know, I didn't want to be playing in front of like a quiet place with everybody looking up my way. I was perfectly glad to have it just be, you know, a rowdy, noisy bar because I could play and feel like, well, not everybody's really paying attention to this. Sure. And so, I just I was just looking at the banjo neck the whole time and just playing and have my head down. And I'm just concentrating, hoping I get through it OK. And it seemed to go over OK. And that gives you a little bit of confidence. Yeah, and I started with no confidence, no experience. And you get a little taste of, OK, it went all right. You didn't die. Nobody yeah. else died. You got through it. And somehow you live to see another day. And so you get another taste of that a year later. And, OK, now. I got to sit in at this club and play two or three songs and everybody cheered, you know, but they were cheering anyway. They would have cheered if I'd fallen down. <laughs> no, but I get what you're so, saying. So it, gives you, it gave you just yeah. enough to go, all right, I, I can live through this, you know, and, yeah. I, and, 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 and this is how I make my living. You know, I'm going to have to be able to, to do this in front of people because at that time, nobody was going to be paying me to sit home and play. Yeah, that's kind like of today hard. where you almost could sit home and play and get yeah. anything. There was not that technology or avenue then. I thought, well, I'm not, I'm going to have to overcome it. But it, I'm not a performer. I I had no, you know, thing of like, well, I have a show. I'm going to be entertaining and tell jokes and, you know, I had none of that. I just wanted to be able to play in a band and be with four or five guys really playing the music. I mean, that's that's what appealed to me. And I felt like the connect the camaraderie, the camaraderie, the connection sort of like all it's like a it's like all for one, one for all. You're you're all in and you're playing this, you know, music that's an ensemble thing. And, you know, I was able to sort of like tune the audience out and really not pay attention to it.
Sure. You know, Good for you, man. Uh, so playing tricks on myself on, on gigs that really made me nervous. I really would. I mean, this sounds not dark, but I would think of historical events, horrendous historical events, and think, wait a minute, is this really the worst thing? Yeah, frame of reference. That, that, no, that point? makes sense. You know, is this? I, I think in the in the grand scheme of things. You know, we don't have to go that far back in history to see horrible things that have happened, not to dwell on it, but I actually did use that as kind of a little bit of a psychological tool to go, man, in the grand scheme of things, if I mess up Foggy Mountain Breakdown, right, it really is a no comparison to what went on in World War II. I mean, it just really isn't. <laughs> and that's a very smart strategy as far as like you change your frame of reference. Frame of reference, man. Just, just, just zoom out. There, there's this widen the lens and there, instead of focusing on and i had many times the sweaty palms and looking at my hand and hoping that my fingers were in the right place and my heart was up to like 300 beats per minute you know like <laughs> you know it's like holy hell you're focusing so hard in like that and it just widen yeah widen it out it helped right. it did it got me through that's a good, a that's actually a good, that's a good thing to, to actually go, a good exercise to go through for anything that freaks you out. Man. Yeah. Because you're yeah, like, you know what, what am I going through here? Let's be real, you know? Yeah. Right. Right. That's, I, I actually like that. Uh, there's this old, I don't know, it's kind of like a joke where the, uh, this girl leaves her dad a note and it's like, she's, uh, she regrets to tell him, but she's out with the, you know, the tough guy in school and she's been dating him for a while and doing drugs. And, you know, Oh, by the way, she's pregnant. And, you know, the guy, the father's beside himself and he comes home and the girl comes home and she says, and he says, honey, what the hell's been going on? And she says, look, I have to tell you something. Uh, none of that's true. I just failed my test. <laughs> and it was the same thing. Cause it was like, he was like, Oh, thank God. That's not a big deal. <laughs> You know, something, it, I, yeah, it's I've like this before somewhere, but that's, uh, that's really, that, it, that's, it's the same exact thing you're talking about. It's changing your frame of reference so that you have perspective on an event that is in your best interest instead of in your worst interest. And that, yeah. that's, that's what we have to play games with ourselves all the time. We play a little games. And I haven't had to do yeah. that much recently, but early on, certainly that I would use that. Sometimes I wouldn't think of it and still be nervous mm. and also surviving like really, you know, uh, times where I really fell on my face. I remember entering a contest. This is both, I don't even think the store had opened yet. I went to the, this local fiddler's convention and I just went to jam. And then some guy was there. He, I'd seen him around. He said, man, you should enter the contest. I was like, I'm not going to enter the contest. I didn't work up anything. You know, I could play like six songs or whatever. He said, no, you should, you should enter. So I thought, all right, I'll do it. And I did terribly. I was super nervous everything's out of tune had to stop start over again and then i played something really too hard and the string popped out or whatever and so and i felt terrible i was like oh god now i really feel like you talk about that dark thing yeah i, yeah. Like, well, I better you know go to job corps <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> i think maybe this <laughs> right for me i think you know i mean i hadn't even been in a band yet i mean yeah, i got really I really had no business entering a, a contest, but I did. If one thing I can say for myself, and I don't usually say much for myself, but I, I didn't let it ruin me. Okay. I, mean, I felt like shit. I mean, I came home. I wasn't in tears, but I was close to it. And it mm. was like, I remember sitting in my room, just staring out the window going, well, I, what else do I want to do? Yeah. You know? But I didn't, I didn't put it away. You know, Good for I think you, a man. lot of times a situation like that could make someone go, you know, screw it, man. I'm not going to touch that thing for a, a month. You know, I'm going to do something else. But it's like, I mean, part of it was I didn't have anything else I wanted to do. And well, even also, that, I really only, I was like, all right, I got to figure out why it went so badly. Why did I get so nervous? How come I, you know, played too hard and out of tune? You know, it's like, let me, let me address that. Let me, let me get on this. Well, also sometimes the pain, sometimes when I know, like if I'm making a decision, the short term 
pain of dealing with something pales in comparison to either the long-term pain of never doing it again, which in your right. case, or yeah. the, you know, the, the enthusiasm you have to pursue it. You know what I'm saying? So sometimes yeah. it's, again, it's perspective, you know, mm -hmm. sacrifice discipline a little bit, you know? Yeah. See, I never even thought about using that perspective thing at that contest. I was like, I hadn't even dawned on me to, to do that. That would have been very helpful. No, it's a really good one. Actually. I like that a lot. Sweaty palms, nervous. Everybody's looking at me. You know, and being by myself, I think I had a, a, some guy backing me up on the guitar, but, you know, uh, it, but still that feeling of it's all caving in and closing in this yeah. black hole. <laughs> well, when you're younger, too, you're you don't have, you know, at this stage of the game, you could just say, you know, screw it. I don't give a shit about how anybody thinks or whether I do well or, you know, you want to do well, but it, right. like, if you mess up, you're, a, a, you know, Hey, you're going to mess up. You know, you're going to mess up at some point just through a statistical yeah. number of I notes you're playing I had that at that age. I yeah. Did. Nobody does. Nobody does. You know, when I, I read about some of these other guys and they just, some of them seem to have that thing. Really? Um, man, I'm just going to get out there and do it. And I don't care if anybody likes it or not. I'm just forging ahead. And, and it's a real, I mean, those, that's a really admirable thing. They just like, they somehow that thing didn't enter the question, the, the equation. They just sort of went for it and they weren't that concerned about did everybody like it or love it or did they do mm. well? They tried to do well and they did well and they weren't, you know, caught up in, in that anxiety. And I think that would have been great to have that. But yeah, I was very shy and, you know, no confidence. Because you have you get confidence with experience, but if you don't have any experience, you don't have confidence, and it's like mm. a double-edged yeah thing going catch twenty-two going in the wrong direction. So, yeah. so what you have to do to get confidence is by doing things in front of people, and part of that you talk about that life-changing thing. The store was really helpful on that because it was really just two of us there, sometimes three. And a lot of times, you know, I had to wait on customers, certainly, and greet people when they came in and try to be knowledgeable and learn and help, you know, so I'm, I'm like dealing with strangers every day, which I didn't do in my childhood. Plus, I had to learn eventually to do things in front of them, demonstrate an instrument. Yeah. Or if they come in, they want to get their strings changed or some little minor repair, you know, you couldn't just take it in the back and leave the store unattended. I had to do it at the front counter. Right, right. It's like, you know, answering the phone and, and working on somebody's guitar, nothing heavy, but I'm talking about minor adjustments. And you start like doing stuff in front of people. So that gave you more confidence. Way more. That yeah. helped tremendously. And then every day, I mean, this happened every day. I had to do things, perform tasks in front of people. Sure. That turned my life around. Right. Because it was aside from playing music, and then it's sort of like that. Then it made it easier to go to the bar, and and play and play more challenging things and things I wasn't really very up on. But I'll give it a try, you know. And you get the experience of the more you play, the more you're willing to take chances and sure. learn how to recover, and all of the the things that come from the experience of playing. But for someone who's painfully shy, you know, that took me a while to get through. But but it was the combination of interaction at the store having to do tasks in front of people i mean i've run into people um i remember running into a like a repair guy somewhere uh, i can't remember exactly where it was and and i, I asked him i told him i do repair too and you know just interested in this kind of stuff i said do you mind if i watch what you do and he says yeah i do mind i don't, I don't want i don't want i don't work in front of anybody and he wasn't being mean no, but that's kind of weird. But, but, but his thing was, man, I, I don't do any of this in front of somebody. I never work in front of my, I don't ever touch an instrument and work on it in front of the customer. That's weird, to be honest. So I'll talk to them. I'll really tell them what is. I'm going to do. But you now you can go and come back next week and pick it up. And then we'll talk then. And if, yeah, and if something needs to be tweaked, I'm sure he would make an adjustment. But his, you know, and I'm, I didn't knock it. I, I thought, well, okay, that's kind of where I felt <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's how I felt when I was 16, you know, it's sort of like, man, I don't want to do this in front of anybody. I just want to play my banjo and learn how to do it. I don't, I don't want anybody seeing it or hearing it. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. That's kind <laughs> so of weird it. though, to be yeah, honest. I, I sort of get what this guy feels like. Um, but eventually I got comfortable enough with that, man. I do all kinds of, I'll, I'll do any repair in front of somebody. 
Yeah, why I mean, not? like when you have to do it, install a guitar pickup on someone, they just bought a brand new Martin guitar and now I got to drill a hole in the back. <laughs> yeah, that I could, that I get. And open up the end pin, that you know, I get. right in front of them at the front counter. That I get. You know, they're, yeah, I couldn't do that right away, but after a while I was like, yeah, okay, I've done a hundred of them, I can do that. Right, right. But you know what I mean, it's the experience that, builds and and then it feeds the confidence totally so now yeah getting on stage not really it's ex it's an exciting good feeling not a dreadful oh my god and, you know, i don't want to mess up it's sort of like yeah and but you know you get the butterflies when it's a new arrangement first sure. time out playing a new arrangement it's like eh, yeah a little edgy but it's good it's a good feeling good now it's now that's enjoyable along these same lines appropriate time question what do you like most about yourself, Mike? Hmm. Um, uh, res some, uh, being resourceful, sort of an inner resourcefulness. I'll find a way. I'll find a way to, to what I say, I'll either solve it or resolve it. Right, cool. The problem comes up, I'll either go, I'll find a way to fix it, or I will rationalize the hell out of it. <laughs> And just what? go. Yeah, all right. All right. Well, I'm, what? Gonna, I'm solve it or resolve it. But one way or another, I'm I'm not going to let it plague me. You know, just like. But I I, I like feeling like, I have I do have an independence. I like doing things on my own. I do like solving problems on my own. But you know, I have failed many times trying to do that, and had to call a professional to fix you know a plumbing thing that I messed up or whatever. But you know, I'm not big into that. But you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's just, totally. it's just sort of like in general, I'll at least try to do it myself, which I did also learn at the store. See, that's another thing. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, so that store was pretty pivotal for you. It was really pivotal because, Steve, um, you know, we didn't have a lot of money over there and we pretty much did our own repairs. And I remember him one time, he said, you know, we really need to get some air conditioning up in the lesson rooms. It's terrible up there. Go ahead and put an air conditioning duct in. Like, oh my god i don't know how to do this <laughs> i mean i didn't go to hvac school or anything like that we had a you know that's like saying calls. you know hey i need so i need a, an operation he said man i don't know he said just look get on the, get the there's the book you know what the golden book was the yellow pages yeah holy Let your fingers do the walk and start looking it up call people because that's what he did when he started that store he came from he was a very smart guy very also very resourceful and he had worked you know somewhere else and decided he wanted to start a bluegrass store with no experience whatsoever he just opened up the phone book and did research on where the music was played anyway that's a whole other story about the whole store but his thing was like man just do it like the nike commercial just figure it out right it's just you know and i was like man i've never done but i did it and somehow it worked it's probably not up to code <laughs> that's nutty <laughs> the man. air conditioning duct that i put in myself but uh but but just as an example it's like oh okay because i wasn't around people like that you know growing up i don't i didn't know anybody in our neighborhood who did things like that we didn't have people in the neighborhood tearing cars apart and engine parts laying around and learning how to wa fix washing machines you know i wish we i wish i had had exposure to that because i really had none of that you know as a kid growing up if the washing machine broke down or your car broke, you took it or you had somebody come over and fix it you know yeah. we didn't and it wasn't like we looked down on that in any way. If anything, I'm I'm thinking, man, that's that's a valuable skill to have. And yeah, I mean, I'd, rather than paying somebody else, why not tear your dryer apart and see how sure. it works? <clears throat> so anyway, that thing that I didn't have really much as a kid, other than that sense of independence, and then later on mixed with a sense of resourcefulness that was. Um, to some extent nurtured at the store like you know figure out a way to get this thing done do, do you do you have hobbies outside of music you know not a lot i mean i do fun things like you know i ride a bike like a, like i did when i was a kid um i read about you know history biographies uh, 
I'm kind of a train buff, mostly because I rode the Pennsylvania Railroad a lot as a kid. And so I love, you know, the history of the railroad, you know, but I'm not like deep into, into all things trains, but I, I, I love that kind of, you know, reading and studying, hiking. I mean, not like Appalachian Trail style, but just like getting out and walking and being active. Yeah. A good movie now and then. Love comedy. Love, you know, anything that's side splitting. <laughs> uh, three more questions, man. And I just yeah. want to thank you in, in advance for everything. Sure. Um, thank you. You're welcome. Toughest decision you've had to make or most difficult thing you've had to do? Besides put in an air conditioning duct. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's pretty difficult. <laughs> well, it all relates to music. I got to say, I definitely, yeah, that's cool. I know that my whole world has been around that. You know, I mean, my other world is my home life, my wife, and we've been married 33 years. And it's, Holy shit. Congratulations. That's nice, I appreciate man. appreciate that. And that's awesome. Yeah. You know, and, 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 you know, there's your normal sort of life things but 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 as far as uh run that again i mean you're talking about like a challenge a particular Tough, challenge toughest decision you've had to make or most difficult thing you've had to do i have to ponder that for a second i mean as far as i can't say there have been that many crossroads because once that music thing started taking off and I knew I wanted to do it, but I didn't know how. And I thought, well, I'm, I may be able to get out of this in the first couple of years out of high school and go elsewhere. But as, as I was getting deeper in it, I thought, well, I think I can, I can do this. And it, strangely enough, it wasn't a tough decision. Mm. It just like as time went on, I felt like, yeah, I think this is doable. Yeah. Um, this may have been a, would be a tough decision for a lot of people. I decided kind of early on, I probably was not going to be raising a family on this. Right. And I was fine with, you know, if I could find some way to do this music and stay in this lifestyle, um, which was really appealing to me. I mean, just the overall world of the music, but also just, you know, everything from the festivals and jamming and the camaraderie. And there was just a certain and then, of course, the nature of the music. And then there's the, you know, learning the craft itself and all that was all encompassing to me. And I, I knew I didn't want to ever set it aside. I knew that that it was not going to be one of those things where, OK, because I had seen this down the road with people older than me where they go, well, yeah, I used to play. I was in a band when I was a kid or had this, but, you know, got married and had a couple of kids and had to sort of shelve the music for a while. Right. I had to get a job. I had to get a real job and had to, you know, music became you know, that, that is secondary. a big decision. And I got to say, I didn't, I did not labor over that decision. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was like, I'm not doing that, you know? So, and then, you know, it costs a couple of relationships along the way. Right. And it, did. it had those, those prices because people, you know, who maybe have a more conventional. Yeah. Most, most people, life, which is yeah. perfectly valid. That's not right. a knock on that, but I knew that totally. wasn't for me. And I, as strange as this sounds, even now, I have absolutely no regrets on that. We don't have kids. I don't, I res, look, man, I, I'm not, a, I don't judge anything in the first place, but I think the fact that you took the time to make that decision ahead of time says a lot about, you know, the under the sense of understanding of the responsibility you need to do that job properly. Well, I knew that I, there was no way I was going to, I just couldn't, I mean, I, I was, wasn't sure if I'd be able to support myself. I, I mean, totally when I first moved get to that. an apartment and I was in my early twenties or I was like 21 or two, I think. So I had been living at home the first couple of years of the store, but I was hardly there. I mean, I was, only yeah, home sure. and once I had a girlfriend, I wasn't even then home. Of course. You know, but um, but but looking down the road, I thought, man, it's pretty slim. You know, I can yeah. I can feed myself and I can keep a used Datsun running and I can I can pay the rent. <laughs> used and I can, you know, and it's like, but that's about it. Yeah. I wasn't starving. I was never starving. I didn't want to be one of these guys that was like living in his car. And, yeah starving musician i really was going to do everything to avoid that that's one of the reasons i stayed at the store yeah 
And some people felt like I was there too long, but I, you know, and there were times when I thought, yeah, I'd like to maybe get out, get on the road, but I wasn't ready for that. Sure. And I needed a steady paycheck, you know, and I needed to be, it wasn't much, but it was reliable and it paid health insurance yeah. and all of that. Plus I had supplemental gigs and all that. And I was like, well, I can support myself for sure. I can finally see that. Yeah, I can do that and actually put a little money in the bank. Good for you. you know? And I was like, okay, then, yeah, then you know, this is it. Then, in other words, at the age of 21 or two, I pretty much had decided this is, I'm fine with that. If yeah. I'm still doing this at 60, I'll be okay with it. Well, the, the, how the worst thing could have been have kids knowing you can't handle it, have them anyway. And then like lose a relationship, not, ha not do the job properly and screw up a couple of kids maybe. So, you know, yeah. I don't, I personally have no problem. I mean, I don't, I don't have a problem with any decisions. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, I've run into some people that, you know, look at me cross-eyed when I sort of view that kind of thing. And I can see, listen, it's, I'm not making a judgment either. Yeah, right. Exactly. It goes both that ways. thing is bad in right. any way. And right. I, I don't hate kids. I was a kid myself. Sure, sure. You know, it's like I don't. I have no thing. But I. But you again. You sort of take that look in yourself and go, "What are the things that are really driving you?" And I got to say, I was not driven by, "Yeah, I really want to have a kid. I want to. I want a kid to follow in my footsteps, or I really want to, you know, coach little league." I mean, I didn't have any of that. Yeah. None. And it's not like I thought that was bad. Yeah, it just wasn't. You're that's that's not that's what you woke like, up in the morning. Absolutely none of that. But yeah. what I really was pulled to was <laughs> banjo. Trying to figure out Bela's solos off of Newgrass Revival albums. That's what I was drawn to. So it's like you know, it's one man's poison, one man's passion, right? Totally, and man. Be, and you really have to figure out what works for you. And then <laughs> the, later on, you go, well, you know what? If I decide later, maybe this isn't the right thing. Maybe I can, you know do the conventional thing or switch. And there are plenty of people that do people. That, and there are people who've also done both beautifully. They not only raised a family, got married, had the kids and successful music career. They're, it's amazing. I've been blown away when I see people that can really do both beautifully. I didn't feel like I have that in me. Yeah. You know, I don't know why that I was uh, very single focused. That topic is a big right or wrong kind of it's almost like that topic is like divorce was in the 50s or 60s like oh yeah. my god i don't have any problem i mean man there's so many shitty parents out there that never should have had kids yeah you know? i hate to always go to the example of well you know what happens if you raise kids and it's all bad because it could have just as easily been all good right you know um so I, that, that's why I try to reserve, like making a judgment on that, because I have no idea. No it could idea, have gone yeah. either way, or could have, you know, who who knows? All I knew for sure was this is what I wanted to do, and I'm really right. glad that I stayed with that because even to this day, I mean, with everything that's going on now, and the way you know, we're off the road and we just play, man, I just I love just going down occasionally in the basement, get the instrument out and play stuff. And it's like, that's what I wanted to do when I was 15. Are you happy? I, haven't, I really have not grown much in 45 years is what I'm telling you. <laughs> I, I hear this from loads of musicians, man, to be honest with you. But are you, hey, here's I love question. being able to do that. It's are not like I've mastered it or, man, you know, of course there's tons of stuff that I, can't do or even fathom and you can still struggle with and all that play but the but from years and years of playing there's enough stuff i can do that i can really enjoy playing good and not have it be like constant grind and uh, god damn it i messed that up it's just like you know man, sure. i can really enjoy playing tunes and things that i loved back then and it was, in fact you know sort of a, a, a little circle around thing you said like how do you get out of a dark time or like say if you're uninspired in music which Plenty of times happens, touring, gigs, or being in a bad band, or you know any number of things you run into. You know, I found that going back to what brought me into it in the first place always pulled me out. Right. Like I'll go back and listen to something that pulled me into this music in September of '73, and right. go, man, that is right there is why I'm doing this. That sound coming out of that instrument right there is the reason that 40 years later, I'm still doing that or 20 sure. years or 30 years. It's like, sure. you know, go back to the well. Yeah. Yeah. 
Totally get it, man. So I went off course there a little bit, but no, no, I I respect your decision, man. I don't. That's no one's business, to be honest with you, on that one. You know, that's how I feel. Uh, two more, man. Most important lesson life has taught you. Well, that's one of them right there. Is to yeah. you know use the George Bush line, stay the course. You know, just sort of like there is something about perseverance. And, and, and you know, for my own for my own um, lifestyle or whatever, just persevering with what I was going after paid off. Yeah. And it took me a long time. I mean, it took me many more times, many more years to get what most people can get in just a few years now Mm. with the available information. But, you know, I was just, I could pick up things. You were talking about learning curve early on. You know, there was sort of a learning, that big jump immediately going from zero to something. But I, you know, really stumbled a lot early on, had to go back, relearn it again. Um, Still working on things I've been playing for years, you know, so it's sort of like, but the perseverance, just keep at it. Right on, man. That uh, that whole business of relying on your inner resources. Yeah, man. And, And last question, Mike, what's been the biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years and how much of that change has been intentional and how much is just a natural part of aging? There's a natural part part of aging. One thing that, that I look at sort of humorously is uh, I feel like when you turn 60, your driver's license is practically a get out of jail free card. <laughs> it, it educate me because I got three years to go. <laughs> three and, three well, and a half. You go through something. life, I'd be worried about everything you do. You know, if you, if you, you know, fall down at the bank or something, you feel like an idiot. Mm. If you, uh, you know, go out and buy something and you get the wrong thing or, you know, you just didn't understand somebody because they said something, but you misinterpreted it. You go, man, I'm old. <laughs> break you know? it down talk to me like i'm in third grade yeah yeah, yeah. Well, uh, yeah almost <laughs> I, mean, I wasn't even thinking like that but more like you can really ease up on yourself yeah you really ease up on yourself a little bit and go it's it's not that you go i don't care anymore that's not that's not it it's not a matter of i don't care anymore it's that when you mess up you're, not you're more forgiving off. you're for, more forgiving way more forgiving yeah. And you can give yourself a little bit of leeway and go, man, I've been here 60 plus years now. I mean, that's that that speaks for something. Sure, man. It speaks for, you know, just a number of years of doing one thing or a million things or whatever it is. But it's a life experience. Yeah. And yeah, sure enough, man, my memory is, you know, is it's not fading, but I can see the little mess ups. I can see the little hiccups. Right, right. You know, not, I'm not talking about Alzheimer's or anything like that, but I'm yeah. just talking about, you know, just sort of like, oh man, I forgot, man, someone just told me to make a phone call and five minutes later I forgot to do that or just, you know, sure. scattered or can't, you know what I mean? Just little things that you used to be like on top of and feel like, oh, man, I got to stay on top of this and be 100% all the time. And now, yes, it, you're more forgiving because there is a natural aging thing. Right, right. It is a little slower getting in and out of a chair. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, you, you know, know what, man? All these little things, but you accept them and go, yeah, man, I'm, what the hell, man? I'm 63. You know, it's like, it's okay. But what's cool is you still want to balance that with, I still want to do what I do well. Right. And I really care about that. But, the, but I feel like the pressure is off in certain ways just that age thing because i'm not really at this point career oriented i totally get it man and and maybe that's a lazy thing because i know you know you got people who are 70 years old or like in college sure so that's commendable um i'm probably not going to be sitting next to any of them (laughs) oh man hey listen uh (laughs) let me tell you know what i mean (laughs) i do i do man let me uh, tell people where to find you. And first of all, thank you again for all your time and for being thank so you. open. I really appreciate it. A and, pleasure. Uh, thanks for being our first banjo guest, man. Couldn't have got yeah, a better guy. Banjo's great, man. Keep the five alive is what it's Keep the people. five alive. I like that. Five so, alive. It's a great instrument. There's a lot of history behind it. But I think sometimes people hear it and they give it like, yeah, say it's okay or somewhat intrigued. But if you really delve into it and expose yourself to some really high level banjo playing regardless of genre i think it will amaze you right on man 
So uh, from UNFORD, first of all, you can check out Mike's playing on all of the Frank Sullivan and Dirty Kitchen records. The last one is called If You Can't Stand the Heat. It is a phenomenal record. But in general, the band is tight as hell. They are really cre great arrangements, as Mike said earlier. Uh, really good songwriting, very melodic, very accessible music, man. These It's a very nice band. I'm, I'm hoping you guys will come down here and I could uh, come see you soon. Uh, Love if to. you. Yeah, that'd be awesome, man. Banjo Lessons. If you're interested in working with Mike, either one-on-one -on -one if you're in the Mid-Atlantic region or through Zoom Lessons, he is available. Uh, there is not, this guy's been around, been there and done that on the banjo. So if you're a brand new banjo player, advanced, intermediate, or if you're a guitar player and you want to make the transition, he plays both guitar banjo, all three guitar banjo and mandolin. Uh, I'll give you his email address in a second. The other thing is if you are interested in repair and setup for banjo, guitar, and mandolin, uh, more specifically banjo, and whether, again, whether you're in the mid-Atlantic region or if you're out of the region but you're looking for a pro, again, who's been there, done that, uh, and he will, he'll, he will do it in front of you. He'll do a Zoom for, for a slightly extra charge. He'll show you how he does. He'll replace a Martin pickup. And, uh, here's Mike Sadgers, but contact him. Let him know what you got going on, what's wrong with your instrument, and I'm sure he'll tell you whether he can help you or not and, and uh, just be detailed in your explanation or same thing with lessons. Uh, and you can contact Mike at MM5, the number 5ST, which stands for Mike Munford 5 Strings. So MM5, the letter S, the letter T, at AOL.com. Everyone over 60 has an AOL address, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm on a... I'm on a movement to get you guys to convert to Gmail. No, no, it's cool. MM5ST at AOL.com. Is there any other records that uh, you were on that people could check you out on? Yeah, but just let me just back up one thing. I don't really yeah. teach mandolin at all. Okay. Uh, banjo, a little bit of guitar. I play some lead guitar, bluegrass guitar and rhythm and all that, but I'm not a mandolin player. So uh, it's just a mandolin uh, setup. I can do some basic mandolin setup. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, banjo yeah, lessons. Banjo lessons, for yeah. sure. And some basic guitar lessons. Cool. Um, yeah, there was a, a back to Peter Rowan. I was on an album that he did back in the mid-90s that was also Grammy nominated. It's called Bluegrass Boy. Okay, great. Peter Rowan, Bluegrass Boy. Awesome. So you check Mike out there. Awesome. Peter Rowan, Bluegrass Boy. All righty. Um, any final words of wisdom, Mike? Yeah, I have an observation that I've always enjoyed using. I use the uh, driving a car analogy a lot with playing music uh, because it, it comes into play and in how people get from A to B, like teaching somebody off of a written page of music. We use tablature and banjo more than written notation. You know, so we use... Um, so a lot of students will, will learn to read tab and they're, they're learning and note by note like this. And then trying to get them away from that is very similar to how you drive. And now the old days, you would have to get a map. to If you have a job across town, you get a map, you get directions, you're reading the directions. And, and that after doing that several times, you might only have to refer to the map once in a while. And after a while, you can just get there. Right. You just, get there and then when you're really familiar with it when you become familiar with a piece of music you're working on you get to the point where if there are roadblocks or construction or whatever you find ways around it yeah man you, find, you can cut through gas stations alleys go this way and you're gonna you'll make it and it's very similar to that feeling of getting away from written i gotta read it and be able to see it and then you know, I can't play this until I internalize it. You internalize it. You internalize directions that way. Yeah, man, that's a good analogy. So that's one way. And the other way that I noticed years ago, and I'd be curious to hear your take on this, is if you're in a band with any people you know pretty well, see if they don't drive the way they play music. That's interesting. If, they if you play with someone who's who's very aggressive, kind of like a real you know, on stage front guy, but he's like you know kind of aggressive, maybe a little overbearing. See if he doesn't change lanes a lot. I I will tell you an observation I've had from doing this show, and this is not and don't everybody listening don't go back and listen to interviews. You're not going to pick this up. Guys that are in the metal genre, not all of them, but they have more drama 
going on in their lives. I've noticed that. Yeah, yeah. Because I always, I always try to uh, learn about people, what makes them tick and this and that. And I've noticed that people in the metal, they have more personal drama in their life, like relation, not all across the board. This is not a, this is just an observation by, yeah. you know, maybe relationships are a little shakier or, you know, maybe they still using substances that, you know, they probably should have put down or, you know, that's one thing I've noticed about musicians. Right. Uh, bluegrass, I will tell you straight up, 90% uh, of the bluegrass players I've met were raised in the music, as you very well know. Right. And 100% uh, of them are very open people, man. Some of the most open-minded people that I've met are blue. Musicians in general are very open, very open-minded. It can but, be, yeah. Yeah, but bluegrassers, um, in particular, it's very uh, family. It's almost like, hey, man, come hang out. Yeah, man, let's yeah. chat. You know, it's, it's a very familial kind of thing. Absolutely. There's a Which real is, community. But I think other genres have a community to them. I yes. don't know much really about the metal thing, but I can see where someone who's drawn to a music that is very highly aggressive and and dramatic in its own presentation would be drawn to probably a little more chaos a little more chaos in, yeah. in their life and i think that's why that whole driving thing again is a reflection of of how you handle just a particular task and I mean, it just i just have noticed over the years that people that if they play with kind of a gentle touch they sort of stay in the right lane and if you play with someone who's <laughs> a nervous player they're going to be like worried about missing the next exit and we'll check in the map again. Interesting. And, you know, there's just like, there are parallels like that. And I also knew this one musician um, who, man, he never used a map. He was just like this great instinctual player. He just had this amazing instinct that he didn't really read music, but he just could play just really just great stuff. And he kind of got to gigs like that too. And, hey, do you need direction? No, man, I'll, I'll find it. I'll, find I'll get it. there. I just, yeah. I'm talking about the old days, not GPS. Yeah, 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 just, sure. Just didn't, all he needed to do was tell him the town or whatever. He would just, he'd be there and be there on time. He just, his instincts of getting from here to there were just as reflective in the way he played music as, as the way he was, you know, driving. That's very interesting. Yeah. Man. That means my daughter, my daughter probably <laughs> loves it. It doesn't always line up, but it's just, you know. Yeah. Interesting, man. Well, hey, thank you for everything. I really appreciate your time. You got here, it. Hang on a second. Good work. Thank important. you. This is thank important you. too. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Everybody, thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Thanks very much to Mike Munford for uh, breaking our banjo cherry and being such a good guy about everything. Uh, don't forget, if you want to work with Mike on banjo lessons or if you need some repair and setup work, mm5st at aol.com and check out all his music with Frank Sullivan and Dirty Kitchen and uh, Bluegrass Boy, the album with Peter Rowan. And uh, most important, remember that happiness is a choice. Choice, so choose wisely. Be nice. Go play a guitar or your banjo and have fun. Till next time. Peace and love, everybody. I am out. Mike, thank you for everything. Thank you.